Good morning, this is the News Wire. I'm Lea Ubaga. Governors will today meet to discuss the ongoing doctor strike as well as the implementation of court orders issued by the Employment and Labour Court last week. The emergency meeting of the Council of Governors is coming at a time when medical services have been paralysed for 14 days today, with doctors pushing the government to implement their grievances. Yesterday, doctors and medical interns in Nakuru County marched from the Nakuru Annex Hospital to the governor's office towards the Nakuru County Assembly buildings before completing their march at the Nakuru Referral Hospital over the 2017 CBA. To urge the government to fasten their belt to ensure that the issues on the table are solved as quick as possible to prevent the ongoing doctor strike and to prevent the suffering of the common Mwananchi. In Meru County, doctors protested the government's plan to start sending medical interns to various hospitals from next month after reducing their benefits by 90%. Doctors official Dennis Mugambi vowed that they'll not return to work until the government fully restores their privileges. By reducing the salaries of doctors by 91%, we shall not accept we are members of this particular country we are citizens of this country patients seeking medical services at public hospitals have continued to struggle as they don't know where to get help at the kisi referral land training hospital surgical services were unavailable this even comes as some mps including Babu Awino from Embakasi East as well as Gadoni Wamuchomba have given the government seven days to deal with a doctor strike or they'll submit a bill to remove health CS Susan Nahomiche from office. The CS, Cabinet Secretary for Health, who, is, who has proven to be very incompetent, yes. Yes. very incompetent, talking in rallies anyhow, talking in funerals, and we want that cs to step aside and we will bring an impeachment motion against the cs for health we want the president himself to call for a meeting with kmpdu the latest group after clinical officers to issue a strike notice are the Kenya National Union Medical Laboratories officers. Rongo University has been closed indefinitely of a student unrest following a hotly contested election. The university senate held an emergency meeting when the situation at the university got out of hand and spiraled into running battles with police officers. Following the incident, all students were directed to immediately vacate the university premises. Rongo's university Vice Chancellor Professor Samuel Gudu say tensions had been building at the institution as students elected their new leaders. MTV journalist Rita Tinina will be buried today at her home in Narok County. Tinina will be buried at the family farm at Nosupen area about two weeks after her sudden death, which autopsy revealed was pneumonia. On Monday, relatives and friends gathered at the Holy Family Basilica for her memorial service where family, friends and media gave their tributes. Tinina's partner Robert Nagila described her as the most stubborn person he had ever met. Rita, who passed away at the age of 46, has left behind a child named Mia Malaika. Rita, when our paths first crossed, your beauty, hearty laughter and warm heart touched me. You are also the most stubborn person I ever met. Principled in your beliefs. Nina, last Sunday, your phone stopped ringing. Your passing has left a void that cannot be filled. But I am comforted with the fact that the memories of time spent will live on without us. That's the news wire. I'm Lea Obaga. One oh two point five Spice FM Kisumu. The following takes place from 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. every weekday on Spice FM. Good morning and I love your show. Thank you. Thank you. Having come from a Kikuyu radio background, I migrated to Spice <laughs> because of the content. 
I was born in a slum, but somehow I got a break in life. So sometimes when you see the sweating coming out because of the passion and whatever it is, <laughs> <laughs> behind the noise, there are people and we share the same umbilical cord. It shouldn't be like that. I am so disappointed. We used to tell Honda Boraila Molotinga that he's doing police of conmanship. And even President Uhuru Kenyatta, Sirikali, he is going to conmanship the earlier you. You cannot promise people that you reduce tax, then you double. In politics, mm. there is uh, the issue of trust. Mm. For you to turn around and then stab the same people who gave you that trust, there is no other level of dishonesty. And I imabo, utaona dunia tu. The Situation Room. Kenya's biggest conversation. The man who looks at a beautiful girl and doesn't talk to her will end up serving lunch at her wedding. Aye, <laughs> <laughs> City, mm. do like that. My father has killed a mouse. Will he fail to kill a man? I'm a wapanya. Small mammal, big mammal. Mtu atamshinda. I'm in a door and how are we comparison? I mean, you mouse. What are they saying? What they're saying is, uh, my father has killed a man. <laughs> <laughs> Will he fail to kill a man? <laughs> <laughs> name, surprise. Someone's name. So, the name I'm surprised the, you? No, the name is surprise. <laughs> no, what am I saying? I'm from Nigeria, man. I met somebody <laughs> called I Believe. So, See? Uh, your name is I Believe? Yes, my name is I Believe. But that's the short form. I said, excuse me? I said, yes. My no name problem. is I Believe. What's no, the fool? No, I believe in the goodness of God. <laughs> <laughs> The situation. Thank you very much, Eric, and it's good to be at the situation room. Always a pleasure coming here. This is the most challenging uh, interview panel in Kenya. You guys are very well informed, and as you can see, Charles today very philosophical. <laughs> <laughs> to be poor in this country is the greatest sin you can commit, not just from a legal perspective, but from life generally. Yeah. It, it, it is very, very skewed. We've just had you know, on the floor of parliament just most recently a leader within the odm saying that sisi ni ngombe is a baba yeah which means that you are willing to be milked dry <laughs> you cannot force me to believe i'll give away if it's a land that i'm told to return to you i will okay because the court has said so but i'll continue saying <laughs> that's all that i'm doing <laughs> The situation. Good morning and welcome Kenya's to Wednesday. What's happening on the roads this morning as we're getting into it uh, today? Let's take a look. Uh, coming off of Fika Super Highway, always your port of call number one. There's a little bit of movement coming through towards the Pangani underpass, as can be expected at this hour. But apart from that, you're coming from the Fika Super Highway with no issues whatsoever. whatsoever. All right, coming out of Westlands also looks pretty good on Waiakiwe. We're going to see a little bit of a hold up here and there just as you pass Mountain View, but you'll be okay beyond that. The Southern Bypass, as usual, looks really good right about now. And as you're coming in from the Eastern Bypass, going towards Outer Ring at the junction, you'll be okay as well. Cabanas going towards North Airport Road, out towards the Eastern Bypass. That outbound traffic flowing smoothly. We don't see any hold ups just yet, but quite some movement on Manyanja Road as well as on Kangunda Road will probably end up in a bumper to bumper situation at some point but now it looks pretty good we won't be seeing a hold up at least not for now we're going to keep an eye on things and see what happens as we get into traffic hour this wednesday in the meantime how about we talk on spice fm ke on x hashtag the situation room This is The Situation Room, the home of hard-hitting political commentary and penetrating insights about the state of the nation. This is a talk radio experience like no other. The Situation Room, a place for hard truths, debates, and elevated conversations. The Situation Room, witty, political, engaging, deep, controversial. In the room, we have C.T. Muga, researcher, academic, seasoned political observer, a fountain of wisdom, Wisdom in these politically uncertain times. Ndu Oko, Nigerian by birth, Kenyan by choice, communications expert, Pan Africanist, a truth seeker and believer in people power, and Eric Latin, agent provocateur, the man in the chair, seasoned journalist, news hound, a man who believes in punching up, not down. This is the Situation Room. 
the only way to start Good your day. At a few minutes after six o'clock, actually, to be specific, it's about ten minutes after six. It's the twenty seventh of March, twenty twenty four, and Kenya's biggest conversation starts now. How's your morning? Everything hunky dory. Getting into Wednesday like whoa, and here we are getting into today. Hope everybody's doing all right as we're getting um, through the month very very fast did you know that on a day like this it would already be the 27th of march you did not because on the 27th of february of january it felt like there were 54 more days left in the month and look at march january do you see your mates do you see what your mates are doing people who also have 31 days in the month very fast moving through it and as we get into it i wish you all good morning and welcome a number of conversations lined up. But before we tell you about what those are, how about we say good morning to this fine gentleman. Eric Latif, good morning. Mimi Nikosawa Kabisa. It's not yet Thursday. It's not. Aye. We know that not Cheswa. Gregory. Gregory. Surely. I mean. How are you? I'm all right, thank you. Good. Had a good day. I did. I was quite, hey man, I was uh -huh. quite productive. Uh -huh. uh, I was. Uh -huh. Then I've got to tell a story. Mm. So I have to go to the dentist, right? <clears throat> my teeth, my back, the, the. Thank you very much. That's the word I was looking for. Mm -hmm. So they're impacted, which means that my teeth essentially grow into the bone of my jaw. Right? So it's very painful. Uh -huh. Sometimes I find myself grinding. They grow into the bone of the jaw. Yeah, they're impacted. out of. What do you mean out of? Where do the two teeth? So instead of growing where do the this teeth way, grow out of? So, instead so of they grow out of the jaw. So instead of them growing up, yeah. they grow inward. So they're impacted this way, the back ones, right? So, the, uh, so uh, instead uh, of your uh, teeth uh, coming uh, out, it's going inside. So it, they're growing this way instead of growing this way, and it's just these four. Oh, but they're coming out of the jaw. Yes, they are. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So what happens is they cause a lot of pain, uh -huh. and so I have to go get them essentially cut out. Yeah, you have to get them. You have to get surgery done to remove the. Oh, is it funny alignment? <laughs> How it's already it's already formed. You know when you're panel beating. Yeah, funny yeah. alignment like this. Kaza kaza pande, kaza kaza pande. Yeah, these wires straight. I see people who have it on their teeth. Mm. <laughs> it can never be me. <laughs> Those braces. Mm. Uh, you can't put alignment. wires. Because ah. the wires, you know, kaza kaza, they, you know, they're like Dr. Rufus told me that mm. you can't, he, what he needs to do is essentially remove them. Cut your jaw. So he removed one a couple of months ago. All right. And he said, the best thing for us to do is remove all four of them on the same day, but it would be too painful for you. The after, so we'd, we'd rather remove one set and the other set. Ndu, in a lack of wisdom, said, you know what, just remove one and then I'll come back another day. Another day has been too long. Now, you know what is happening? Mm. The tooth on top. See, now, normally, they stop growing because there's another tooth. Mm. That, that so the other one is now, is, is now just going. I'm like a vampire. I so it has grown into that gap. It has. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good thing, isn't it? No, it's extremely uncomfortable. It's not painful, just uncomfortable. N no, the, the, the lower jaw ones are the ones that are very so painful on your, the impact. Your tooth is biting your gum. Yes. And now I feel it more than ever because it's clear. And even when I put my finger there, it's clear that it's grown longer than the rest of them. So mm. I'm a vampire. Don't play with me in the night, like around 11.59. Well, it just means you can't bite me. Ooh. There's no space. <laughs> <coughs> so it's no space. I find myself gnashing my teeth a lot. For mm. 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 That's not a bad thing, is it? It's very uncomfortable. Then later I feel this pain in my head. Like just now I felt okay. ringing in my ears. Have you called the doctor? I've talked to Rufus. I'm going to go see him today. To remove that. So the no, ringing in your it. head is because of the overgrown teeth. <laughs> it sounds so bad. Like an overgrown tooth. That's not like a... No, it is an overgrown tooth. What animal is that that has a tooth jutting out of its mouth? Saber tooth tiger. That's what hog? Not, what hog? <laughs> like, <what>? Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that was my story for the morning. Good morning, CT. Kukonangiri <laughs> Yeah, me, I'm prehistoric on this one. Yeah, saber tooth. <laughs> Tiger. <laughs> yeah. Sasa City. Fit. Mambo ikoaje? Sawa kabisa. Eh. Mm. Very good. No. Mimi niko poa kabisa. Mm. Pia. Wewe uko maridadi. Niko maridadi. Mm. Kabisa kabisa. Mm. Yes, yes. So let me tell you what we shall be discussing uh, today. Um 
uh, several things. Thing number one. Ranging from? Thing number one. We'll be talking, having conversations, health, healthcare, insurance, planning for your future, goals, goals, Haiti. So number one. Peter Washira, the CEO of ICA Lion Trust Company, will be joining us at 7 a.m. to talk about the right financial goals to secure your future. What's your plan? Uh huh. And how do you use ICA Lion to solidify your plan? Okay. Dr. Patrick Amorth is the Acting Director General for Health. He'll be joining us at 8 o'clock. We'll be talking about this thing. So, doctors' strike enters the 14th day today, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And. Uh, the clinical officers have threatened to join them, isn't it? And then other healthcare workers. So we are seeing what's happening in the country is that more and more people are going and finding uh, issues in health facilities. This and many other things that are happening in our healthcare system. So we're talking about rolling out UHC. Uh, the law was signed last year. We are into the third month of the new year. It had been said that, you know, this new year we'll be doing things where are we in terms of our health affairs in the country? Dr. Patrick Amoth, the man in charge of health, joins us at 8. At 9 o'clock, let us talk about uh, Kenya, diplomacy, and then look at, so why are we going to Haiti? And why are we making this whole move until we go to Haiti? We'll be joined by communication strategist Mark Bichachi. And Ambassador Dr. Josephine Ojumbo. Dr. Ojumbo is the former Deputy Secretary General of the Commonwealth. She'll be here alongside Mark at 9 for that conversation. Here, yes, Karam Magani. So, so. Yes, yeah, yeah. We can see you on uh, YouTube. We can also see you on Facebook. Thank you very much for tuning in. We cannot see you on radio, but we know that you're there. And we thank you very much as well for tuning in. 17 minutes after 6. If you're online, let us know where you're tuned in from. And we'll tell us what uh, the weather's going to look like today. We know it'll be raining in several parts of the country. And then we'll say hello. Cloudy conditions in Nairobi this morning, 18 degrees. We'll see highs of 25 and we'll see highs of 29 and a partly cloudy Nakuru at 17. The clouds are low at 18 in Yeri with highs of 25 and at 15, Eldoret is cloudy, highs of 26 and lows of 14. It's clear at 27 in Mombasa with highs of 33 and lows of 27. While into Malindi, it's clear at 28 with highs of 33. 21 and mostly cloudy in Kisumu, highs of 30 and we'll see highs of 31 in a mostly cloudy Kakamega at 18. 21 and raining in Kampala with highs of 27, while Dar es Salaam is clear at 26, we'll see highs of 32. It's 15 and clear in Johannesburg with highs of 25, while Mogadishu is already sunny at 25, 28, it'll go to highs of 34. 22 will be the high in a partly cloudy Addis Ababa at 16, coming down to lows of 13, and we're looking at a clear... Um, Lagos at 27 with highs of 34. It's cloudy at 26 in Kinshasa with highs of 33. It'll come down to lows of 25. Wednesday afternoon is sunny at 12 in Beijing, highs of 17 and lows of 7. And we're looking at partly cloudy conditions in Paris at 7 with highs of 12. London is cloudy at 7 with highs of 11 and lows of 6. And round things out in New York. Tuesday night is cloudy at 6 degrees. Coming into Wednesday, we'll see highs of 12. Mature, intelligent talk every morning. Spice up yourself. Mornings done right. 94.4 Spice Hello. FM, Nairobi. Good morning. Namzwa Elisha says, good morning, good people tuned in from Mogadishu in Somalia. Um, Melisama Spice, Aiwezi Shika Kakamega, says who? Says why? Why? Hmm? Uh. Spice. E. I, I speak a Kakamega. KK. Surely. Is it a recent occurrence? Nimakosa. Our nearest frequency is in Eldred, and it's a good one. It's a strong one, Buana. We have a very strong uh, 96.7 Eldred. I speak here, Try, try that, my dear. Try, then you tell us. Mm -hmm. All right. Wambaje Wenzangu. Okay, that's a new one. 
to Ambapoa. Oh, okay, so everything is hunky dory according to Ndu. Yes, it is. Great. Have a showstopper. Thank you very much. Collins, good to have you this morning. And uh, those are folks that are tuning in on Facebook. Live stream is up. Karibu sana. Mm -hmm. Everybody. Um, Michael. Olande says, good morning, tuned in from Kigali. Agri Momani says, Hamjambo, what's happening with MPs from Mount Kenya? What did they do? I mean, what, what do you mean what's happening? Yeah. But did something happen today? What's happening with MPs from Mount Kenya? Yeah. Regarding, do they, do they expound on As this? pertains to, I, push, I don't know, but he's gone so to, I hate to see those who stood for the finance bill now crying over, uh, crying what, more than the bereaved, the shame of our elected leaders. That's what That's what the thing about. is. Okay. Okay. Raphael Keegan Who says, knows what's happening to them? Exactly. Okay. Just like who knows what's happening to the finance bill. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Who does know? Uh-huh. Um, <clears throat> Rafael Kige says, good morning, big team. Bring it on. You guys are sent to inform us. Long live Spice family indeed. Karibu sana. Thank you so much. So George Gashoridi says, good morning, Ndu City and Eric. Happy Wednesday. Looking forward to a great show. Evans Ntabo says, good morning. Ndu City, Eric, Yego, Nyaboke. Waiting. Mambo Motomoto. Nyaboke, make sure Mitambo is okay. Sawa. Ken Korir, Iyamone, Iyomu, I. Yamone, I think that's what they're trying to say. Ndu. Ken Courier says the same thing. Eric CT. Peter Caricho says, Good morning, Spice Team. Can't wait for today's show. Ndu, I just love the way you laugh. <laughs> God bless you all and God bless. Indeed. Robinson Kisero says, Good morning from Hong Kong. Good morning to you. Ibencho Kisi. Joseph Kimonge says, Good morning. Emmanuel Ob. B. O. P. G. says good morning all. Now he's you almost thought you was Openji. Mm. <laughs> I almost said Openji. <laughs> I was this close. Um, when are we seeing the faces of Lea Obaga and brother Seto of the Newswire? I want to see them. Okay, Eric will make it happen. Stella says good morning. People tune in from Dallas, not in Dallas. This one for Machacos, mm. Dallas in Texas. Good morning, my good people. Make it spicy. Sour. I'll give you the proverb for today. If a child washes his or her hands. She could eat with kings. Mm -hmm. It's true. Absolutely true. Chris Adede says, good morning. Greetings from Utawala. Robert Mboko is tuning from Mombasa. Evans Langat says, tuko thika na tuko tuned. Happy WC, <coughs> happy WCW. Yeah, okay. Me am a happy WCW, buwana. Uh -huh. Leo. Hello, Princess Ndu, CT and Eric. Yes, yes. Should we blame the voters or the way we do our politics for the recent KK MP's utterances for blaming KRA for high tax mm -hmm. when we didn't read the bill? Can you imagine? George, Joe Mungai is tuning in this morning. Mashari and Jero is watching from Portland. And God, Chamge, Chamge, Mama. Um, greetings from the beautiful hills of Saboti. Um, we've had a power blackout for three days. Ah, uh -uh. Why? What? What was going on? One mic says, good morning. A major bridge collapsed in Baltimore, Maryland. Yesterday, we saw that. And unfortunately, six people who they've not been able to locate until now, it's being thought that obviously they're dead. So that was quite shocking to see. Um, Jacinta says, good morning. Tuning from San Francisco. Uh, this thing of fertilizer is doing people somehow, Abby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm, we need to have that conversation. Yes. <clears throat> Ogani Malala is tuned in. Azaria says, hello, Spicers. Spice I'm reminding CS Nahum, eh, Nakuminja, mm. Nahumicha, and CS Morkomen that they should protect the lives of poor Kenyans. Sawa. Mm. We can see everybody tuned in. Rose is here. Francis is there. James Vin. CPA Zachary Ondeo. Very, very many people online. If I didn't get to you, it doesn't mean I didn't see you. Thanks for being here this morning. Karibuni sana. Karibu, everybody. City. Yes, please. The Island Republic. Yes, yeah, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. the Mauritius. Mm -hmm. Yes. TikTok. Yesterday's was the one about the big head. TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> Today's. <laughs> uh, the cleverness of one alone is a shallow well that soon dries up. The cleverness of one alone is, is a shallow, shallow well, well that soon, soon dries, dries up. up. Hey. 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 <laughs> Safi sana. Okay, so we're looking at the e-papers today. Yes, we are. Mm. On the front page of the standard, mm. what do we see? If I can get to the front. Hey, this thing is very nifty for flipping. It flips like a page. Yeah. yeah. Okay, on the front page of the standard this morning, um, 
revealed faces of Shakahola horror killings. For the first time, Kenyans are able to see the victims of the Shakahola massacre from young children to women and men as a somber mood engulfs families thronging Malindi mo hospital mortuary to collect the bodies of their loved ones. Yes, quite something. Mm. Man's two lives in the red in US, rich investor in Kenya. How can that be? Is that, uh, yeah. Mm. In the U.S., bankrupt. In Upper the Kenya, Kenya, pesa. Or tas. Ah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is he Kenyan or is he American? He's Kenyan. Ah, very good. <laughs> it's a sharp Kenyan. Senor, <laughs> who will it be, K or K? In mm. this case, mm. Kalonzo or Karua, and there's a battle. Do they know that there's a battle between them? Mm. We don't know. For what? Asimio. Oh. The next guy. The who next kingpin. The guy. KQ <coughs> narrows 2023 loss to 32 billion. Mm. Don't know that that's a good thing, but okay. Why some schools will close a week early? Schools are meant to close on the 4th of April, which is next week, Wednesday. Some of them might, might close early. Mm -hmm. Higher rents uh, on the way for civil servants in government units. That should be interesting. And we'll look at a number of these stories as we go through. Sour, sour. I, Zazawa. Like I can tell you some of the uh, stories on uh, in the nation today. Well, can I tell you one more headline? Okay. Lab staff, clinical workers, mm -hmm. issue strike notice as doctors and pass um, with the state bites. So clinical officers have decided the 1st of April, it's done. We are joining the thing. Clinical officers, these are now lab staff. Yeah. These are lab technicians. Yes. Hey. Well, I'm my 1st of April. We also what 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 is their beef? I'll tell you. CBA, what, I'm a, what they're supporting? No, it's not just support. To them, they said also them. They Even have, them, they have issues. They have issues that need to be sorted out. But we've heard those ones before, haven't we? Here? The latest of the issues, yeah. I'll tell you. They're talking about uh, confirming some of their workers. They're talking about some programs that they were supposed to be on contracts to be employed on permanent and pensionable terms, which they were promised, which have not happened. Ah. Uh, yeah. Okay, okay. It's boring, isn't it? Kabisa. Omo. Kabisa. The nation has uh, several stories. Eh? Job losses as 150, 140 state firms to go. Um, yesterday, the president was meeting the bosses of parastatals, and he gave them a warning shot and said, look, you continue just registering losses, losses, losses. We are shutting down that parastatal. You're losing after all. Yeah. Mm. It's, you have no use to us. State takes on steel tycoons with the new 220 billion shilling plants. Alarm as public schools fail to acquire science kits. And they also look at Senegal, the new president. One president, two mm. first ladies. The case of Senegal. Um, the People Daily's headline today is Parastatal Bosses in Big Trouble. Ruto reads the Riot Act for non-performing state firm bosses to improve their fortunes or be phased out he also told them by the way you must operate within your budget this thing of operating you know, as government we are operating as due expenditure is way higher than revenues no we can't continue like that okay. as a government we must only spend what we raise as revenue sour sour ah yeah okay uh, he didn't say ordinary revenue but just revenue. Just revenue. Okay. Civil servants in for a rude shock of a new house rent. That's an interesting story. It's, it'll be a nice one to see. <laughs> uh, the Business Daily, the big story there is also that one. Housing ministry moves to triple rent for civil servants. <laughs> 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 NHIF system outage leaves thousands of patients stranded. Oh Electricity demand soars on economic recovery. Unpaid pension and pay by state entities goes up to 73 billion shillings. State entities are not remitting pay to carry. They are not remitting uh, pension. 73 billion shillings is a tune. And also they have, of course, the headline. I mean, the story about Kenya Airways losses narrowing by over 40% to 22 billion shillings on the back of rising revenue. Also a headline here, the electricity bus company Basigo gets 395 million shillings to scale up electric buses outputs. We'll look at those stories Ooh. shortly, shortly. Senor, mm -hmm. so first you tell us about uh, the thing called traffic. Okay. Hiya. 
it is a half past six on the dot. This is the Situation Room. The only way to start your day. There it is on the thicker superhighway. There's traffic and it's clogged right around the Pangani underpass, as is to be expected. Things happen when you go through a tunnel. Okay, so you get out towards Moranga Road or you go to Wangai Madai the other way and then it's easy, smooth running, getting into the CBD from there. Not a problem. James Kishuru, you're all right getting onto Waiaki and then crossing over to Red Hill Link Road or then going down Waiaki way out towards Westlands. Everything fantastic. Are you coming off Limuru Road? Then you'll also see that uh, really traffic not doing the thing there at least not for now it's still early let's see what happens but early huh, folks on kangunda road have said whatever we need to get to town we need to get to town all of us now and so there's traffic there it's in and outbound then trying to touch on outer ring which by the way has very little traffic this morning all right folks who are coming in from cabanas going towards north airport road and then touching on outer ring just a smidgen of traffic there and inbound traffic from the eastern bypass is starting to do the thing so if you've not left now might be a good time to do that so you don't get stuck in what will be a hold up in less than 30 minutes that's what it looks like for now let us know what happens where you are we can talk and keep things moving this morning how do we do that you talk to us on spice of mke on x hashtag the situation room mature intelligent talk every morning spice up yourself Mornings done right. 94.4 Spice FM, Nairobi. About the horrors of Shakahola. Mm -hmm. Okay? <clears throat> I'm turning the page. Turn the page. Excuse me. <laughs> All right. Now, for the first time in a year, folks are going to be able to tell who are some of the folks who um, were killed. A somber mood engulfed families of those who perished in the Shakahola forest as they thronged the Malindi hospital mortuary to collect bodies of their loved ones. Tears rolled down William Ponder's cheeks as he collected the bodies of his mother, Esther Biria Masha, nephews Henry Ngonyo and Seth, Hamzi, um, Seth Hinzani Ngala and a sister-in-law, Emily Wanje. His other nephew, Ivabra Dito Ngala's body, was not released yesterday because DNA samples collected from a body they believed was his did not match any relative. It is a disappearance and death of members of Ngala's family that sparked a reaction that unearthed the cult activities on the 25th of March, 2023. It's exactly one month and two days from uh, ago. Uh, rather, one year. One year. One year and two days. Mm. Ponda and his brother Isaac Ngala introduced his family to the cult in 2015. They first went into Shakahola Forest to fast and pray in 2021 and then kept coming and going, according to a Thierry Ponda, um, who said the whereabouts of his brother, a former GSU officer, are still unknown. However, the telltale signs that Mackenzie's Good News International Ministries had turned into a cult started to emerge after the ex-GSU officer um, and his wife stopped taking their children to school. According mm. to Ponda, Emily started campaigns against family planning methods, schools, medicine, and other earthly possessions in this Muyeya village in Malindi in, Kal in Kilifi County. My brother quit his job saying it was better to be God's soldier than serving human beings. Remember, he was a soldier with GSU. Mm. The bodies of Isaac Ngala and his last born son, Imani Ngala, have not yet been identified. Um, and the family has decided to keep the five bodies at a morgue hoping to get the rest. Mm. So still await we are not ready for burial so we have transferred their remains to star funeral home burial is scheduled to take place in april at on the 5th at muyea village in malindi for the other families like that of dr daniel ngati from vihiga county it was a double tragedy and pain he viewed the decomposed body of his father at the morgue but could not collect it due to financial constraints we came on sunday and we've been told to take the remains but we have not means to transport the body to vihiga we are still deliberating as a family to see how we can transport transport our, our father's remains home Mm -hmm. His father, Raphael Temba, had traveled to Shakahola in 2021. The man lied to his family that he was heading to Kitale Town in Transoya County for an evangelism crusade. He realized later that he was in Shakahola and he didn't want us to visit him. These are the tales of many folks who are coming to collect their bodies at the Malindi mortuary. More families like this viewed their loved ones and were not able to collect the remains mm. for very many reasons. When you've lost someone like that, you feel a sense of disconnection. It is difficult for people who loved him to become 
to come together to mourn him. And the stories go on and on and on. Remember, we're getting into another stage of exhumation at Shakohola. In Uposi. Um, and uh, of, the, of the bodies that have been found, even of the 429, mm. those who are collecting their bodies are on the minimum. Because remember what Johansson Odor said. It's only 30 that have been identified. Exactly. Johansson Odor said, <laughs> we don't have, we can't make the connects. Only 30 have been identified. And the bodies that 400 are how many bodies? So 429 bodies, only 30 have been identified. That leaves us with 399. So this exercise that started yesterday, what is it? It's for those who've been identified to come and collect. Just the 30. All these stories is 30 families. All these stories that we are saying here bodies. is just 30 bodies. It's 30 fam Okay, yeah, 30 bodies. Mm -hmm. It could be less families because some people have one, like two, three. Like families, collect. someone this has one collected has four. four people. Yeah. 30 bodies Yeah, is very many bodies. It is. In comparison, however, to 429 mm -hmm. for which they cannot identify. In comparison with 11 students mm -hmm. who passed away in the Kenyatta University. Mm -hmm. Bus tragedy. Yes, 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 yes. You see, it's a daily story daily of people dying needless deaths daily this one for shakahola is not even about a, a daily it's just it's absolute bungling of an operation it's a year more than a year since you started exhuming bodies mm. you've only identified 30 bodies mm. you have exhumed 400 plus mm. bodies mm -hmm. you've only identified 30 a year into an operation you still haven't finished exhuming bodies you have identified okay so there's a mass grave here there's a mass grave. it's raining mm. what exhumation is going on Nothing. we have gotten into the rainy season for the next three months there's no exhumation that's going on now there what is... was taking so long to exhume this i still don't get it shakahola is not you know a densely populated area where you know we first needed to move people so that we can then get into maybe some people are buried under in houses and people are living there no the area was deserted. It was cordoned off. It became a security operation zone. The area is flat. It's not a teen, hilly mountainous region or rugged terrain where it takes so long to send people there. There are people who've been here, GSU, NYS, and other officers, and Kenya Red Cross for the entire one year. What has taken so long to exhume the bodies? But is yeah, it lack of storage uh, facility? It cannot no, be it because be. you can get storage facilities. Mm -mm. It's not what like a it? storage facility. The Red Cross packed up two of their freezers a couple of months ago because nothing was coming. What so is it? So what are we talking about? This is the unfortunate thing is that we, we, we don't have an answer as to why is it taking so long or what is the difficulty of this process. Are we saying that we are completely incapable of actually doing running DNA matching? Because if, we, if, we, if that was the case, we'd have brought in experts from other places. We'd have sought help. The same way Haiti is asking for our support, we could have asked somebody else for our support in, just come with a DNA kit. Here are living samples of people who have reported that their kin are missing. Can Here say, are 400 I... bodies. Can you see which much? Can I tell you something that might sting a little bit? Yeah. If it was important, it Should would be handled. Yes. Yeah, that's just it. The attitude of government here is that, ah, I actually want a kufa. Okay. The people who have reported their kin missing did not want them to die. No. They are looking for their families. And even you as a government, you have questions. You need to know, okay, so what happened to these people? This whole thing is a government just trying to run away from this story. And now they're trying to, you know, just, okay, so we have identified. Now we are starting the release of bodies. Very... Yeah, this is 30. 30 out of 400. How many people are registered there? Uh, 600 636. plus. 636. 636 registered you have a list of 600 people who are registered as missing and those that are registered those are on that register are people who come you've said so and so went missing you've asked you've been asked one or two questions to see the possibility of them being here so those are people who are likely to have been in shakahola 600 plus you found 429 only you've only identified 30 one year later you're releasing 30 bodies e e kitu <laughs> The government of the Republic of Kenya has completely failed on this particular operation. Do has on many occasions said that if you want to understand mm. the very state of a nation, look at how it treats its most vulnerable. Mm. This one you don't need to overthink. It is clear. Mm. How can the story of 
parastatals not performing have an audience of literally every government official highest lower middle it's a big issue and is being discussed mm. and yet while this is being discussed we have a situation where citizens of this country are undergoing pain that seems very clear what happened is not something that is a big mystery mm. but somehow a resolution on this particular matter is just delayed and delayed and delayed and delayed I was looking at one of the headlines about what well, was in the nation mm -hmm. about low flying it, it even featured in Taifa Leo mm. low flying helicopters blue and white mm. that are seen in bandit prone areas mm. okay and you're thinking we read such stories and the speculation these are the helicopters that supply these bandits mm. with arms mm -hmm. we read stories of security personnel being killed by the bandits we read stories of threats more importantly, it's against a background of having been told by the Ministry of Interior that this thing is going to be sorted. Mm. We're in a new year. Bandits are still going about the activities. It's mm. like as though nothing ever changed. Yep. Mm -mm. People are burying their loved ones who've been killed by bandits. Yes. Children are not going to school. Schools have been closed. Many schools have been closed. Bandits. So children can't lose bandits. So, so, so really... What is the priority here, really? Because, because, because these are citizens of this country. These are mm. people just like you. What is it that we're supposed to be looking at? How are we supposed to have faith in this government that doesn't even seem to be able to protect its people? That's a very good question. And I think it's a solid question. How do you have, how do you have faith? How, how does everything else become more important than the lives of people? Mm. How? Mm. The value that we place on life. Yeah. The value that you place in life is what is going to make sure that certain things happen. The value that you place is going to either determine how much effort you put to make sure that people are protected or how much effort you don't. The value that you place on life is going to secure the very much needed funds that you need for your health, for your education, for your security. What value do you place? It may sound like we're being lofty and pontificating, but that's just the truth. That if I place importance or I place action or I unlock some kind of activity on something i'm essentially telling you how important i find that thing or in this case how unimportant or how less prioritized that thing is for me in my position <laughs> call it what you like but that's it plain and simple let's talk about those who are living mm. something else i was reading again we are told that 600,000 600,000 mm. students who sat for the kcse did not register in the kusips portal mm. Mm. okay so you're saying okay if they did not and reasons are given some said they couldn't afford the 1500 required mm. some said it wasn't that they didn't know many 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 stories mm. but you're talking about a very large number of people students the so-called future of the nation who are not just in limbo they are nowhere decisions can't be made regarding their lives they can't move forward at the same time the capitation story has not ended. Mm -hmm. It's still with us. And it's one long story following another. And the backlog just keeps piling up. Can I tell you that story? Is it okay? Yep. May I? Mm. Okay. Here we go. Why public secondary schools may close early? CT, this is just jumping off that last point that you've made. It's in today's headlines. Some public secondary schools may close this week to ease financial burden that has weighed down the institutions due to delayed release of what? capitation money. The, standards are est the standard has established that several secondary schools will send students home this week as they grapple with serious financial challenges. Do you remember the um, PS for basic education, Belio Kips, Dr. Belio Kipsang, last week said, no, by, end of by March. the end of this mm. March, mm. we will send money. Mm. Here we are. Um, according to the revised school calendar, the term began on the 8th of January and the official closing date was set for April 5th. Kenya Primary Schools Association National Chairman Johnson Zioka said it is getting difficult to sustain school operations. What school operations are we talking about? Feeding, what not, what not. Mm. We, would have, we, have, we had been promised that money would be sent and we have been waiting. We needed the money to alleviate pressure from head teachers. Some of the parents who spoke to the standard acknowledged receiving messages from schools to come and do what 
pick your children. I have just received a message to pick my student from school before the Easter holiday, said a parent in Nairobi. Kenya Union of Post-Primary Education teachers, Kupet Secretary General Akelo Misori, said early closure means that the government has not honored its pledge to send capitation to schools. The promises by the ministry are all lies. And it is unfortunate that school managers have been punished to run schools without money. He said that principals will not reopen schools until money is released. So even this one that you're closing, to now open two weeks later, mm. Mm -mm. send money is when we will open. We will not allow teachers to report to schools to manage stress levels again. MPs must appropriate sufficient funds to run public schools and also hire new teachers. You see, appropriation has happened. Mm. Where is the money? Mm. So schools are supposed to have received 11,000 something per child for first term in secondary schools. Yep. They've only received 3,000 bob. Yes. 8,000 bob has not been received. Imagine. Mm. And we're coming to the end of the term. The term is over, man. And then the we start a new term. Tomorrow. And the new term will is supposed to come with the new capitation. Yes, yes. now. And this one has not been paid. It hasn't. And he said it was going to be there this week. Three quarters of what should be paid has not been paid. Mm -hmm. And the conversation does not happen. You know, when they go to parliament, instead of saying that this is the issue, can we call the PS Treasury, the PS Education, where is the gap? PS Education just comes and says, yeah, 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 I've talked to my partner. We'll in, in, and they right? say, he said by the end of this week, he's going to be able to deliver. Why can't we just have an honest conversation? So what's happening? Are we broke if we have a cash crunch what do we then do about it because this is what we need to do Tell county is not receiving money on time education not receiving money on time um, money so that should be going from the national treasury to nhif to finance some areas of of, of uh, health not going money that should be going to the elderly to support them in their daily not going money hey what is and this and the list goes on and on and on and on and on yeah what is this? So all we're doing is just being able to at least just pay salaries. Yes. But everything else. And also talk big. Remember, today's headline, uh, one of the headlines in the nation is the government planning to spend 200 billion on some steel manufacturing, steel this. I mean, why do we have this grand, <laughs> these very grand plans of grand things, mm -hmm. which in theory are supposed to be good, when the very basics that are important to people are not being taken care of? Mm. I mean, where are our priorities? I mean, honestly speaking, where really are our priorities? It doesn't look good, guys. No, it, it it's not good at all. No, it's not good no. at all, at all, at all, at all, at yeah. all, at all, at it's, all. It's not good at all. And it's day in, day out. Mm. Ah. So you know how you get reminders mm. Mm. of things that happen, like a year ago today, mm. like your phone or whatever. Mm. A year ago today, last year, we were having a conversation, because mm. I took a screenshot, mm. we were having a conversation mm. about capitation having not been sent to schools complete for first term <laughs> last year. In, in 2023. In March last year. It just popped up now. Mm. We were having the same conversation. And a year later, we're still having the same conversation. Yeah. It's ludicrous. Into a new financial year. Into, it's, it's just madness. Let me tell you this story about uh, the government tripling rent. Mm. So the housing PS, Charles Hinga, was in parliament yesterday. And he was saying, you know, for the last 23 years, civil servants have been paying the same amount of rent for the houses that they occupy. That's government houses. Okay. And the figures that we are talking about here are a, a three-bedroom house located in a prime location of Nairobi. The rent has been 30,000 shillings. Mm -hmm. so people living in some one-room house, single-room house in Botella Estate, the rent is 1,000 bob okay. for the last 23 years. Now, this matter was... Uh, brought to the fore by the Auditor General Nancy Gadungu, who had raised the red flag over the department's failure to collect a potential annual rent of 1.524 billion shillings, assuming full occupancy of the government's 56,892 houses. Ms. Gadungu said the government houses rent for the financial year 2021-2022 only amounted to 1.018 billion, leading to an undercollection of 506 million shillings not collected and that was with the prevailing rates 
there are civil servants who live in these government houses who are not paying rent. Okay? <coughs> now, Hinga said, actually, I have written to the National Treasury and I'm seeking approval to raise this rent. From 30,000, at least the person who is uh, living in areas like State House, the people who live in State House, in government houses in State House, they should pay at least about 90,000 shillings for a three-bedroom house. What's the house allowance? Do they say? I don't know. They don't say. From what used to be 30,000? From what they're currently paying 30,000. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Because house allowances were increased. They're mm. not the same. They're, they're, they're not, not the same. same. They were 23, 23 years, ago. years ago. This house, you're living here, you're living within a secured place. In So, how much should you pay, be paying for rent? So now, he's basically talking about tripling it from 30 to 90. Mm. 90 to 100 Gs for this three-bedroom house. If you look in many places, you'll find government houses. In many institutions, you'll find government houses where the public officers live. One of the things that I, you notice is actually recently I was looking at some of those houses. You can just clearly tell this is a government house. It's dilapidated. Dilapidated, not mm. been repaired. It's, it's not cared for. At all. Mm. But then I asked myself, so is it that the person who's living in this house is not allowed to do anything? Not well, even to like put a, because, a hedge. Yeah. It's, after all, it's government. Because, yeah. Yeah. Not even a hedge around the house. The window is broken. It stays broken. You just see a... The roofs Why? are leaking, the gutters are broken. Is it that the government says, do not touch, we will come and repair? No, it just could be that attitude, like, it's not my house, it's government house. I live here because I work for government. If I, uh, if something needs if to the, be prepared, If the gutter is leaking, it's okay. Yeah, you know, the, there is a department in government whose function was to actually look after such houses. MOW, right? Yes, exactly. Mm. Mm. Yes. Mm. Now, whether they're still functional is a completely different story. Yeah. yeah. But they were supposed to. But when you say attitude, I think let's look at it a little closely. Mm. Look at how vehicles that are known as GK vehicles, look at how they're managed and handled. Yes. Yep. And look at the graveyard of many government vehicles. Yep. Those in the know will tell you there's just a small thing that requires to be replaced here, but mm. nobody bothers. And then that vehicle will be vandalized to the point where it's just a shell. Uh, yeah. Mm. Then okay. it's on stones at some point. Then it's on stones at some point, yes. Yeah. So. Yes, the attitude towards anything that is government is that, you know, whether it works or it doesn't work, they'll, uh, you'll, you'll acquire another one. Mm. Another one will come. Mm. Exactly. So but the, the one where you're living, you're the one, you are, in that you place are living before. there with your family, uh, okay? okay? So the gutter is broken, surely. Are you saying that you, you cannot be allowed to fix the gutter? I don't think so. The roof is leaking. Mm. Are you saying that we cannot really have a, a, an arrangement here. So, okay, the Department of Works, say, is overstretched. It's not able to repair and maintain all these houses across the country. Have they been financed to do it? Yeah. So what, what is the conversation that we're having? And that Hinga should have these uh, answers and say, what is it that they're, they're supposed to be doing? Remember, it wasn't just government. Many parasitals also had houses in yeah. the major towns. Yeah? Yep. And over the years, you'll find very many parasitals, like, say, Posta, sold those houses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, if you look at the houses that were there and the, and the state that they came into when they were sold, people who bought them refurbished them. Mm. <laughs> it's day and night. <laughs> mm. Yes. The dilapidated structure that you saw and what somebody then did with the same structure, they didn't bring it down. They just spruced it up. Same, same. Very, very different. Now, this is something the government could have done with these. Indeed. Same, same. Mm. Then can you have an, an arrangement and say, okay, if you make repairs, obtain receipts, we can cancel it off or check it off. Hmm. I mean, well, next month you don't pay rent, you know, mm. you know I mean, <coughs> how much have you spent? So someone Put can come and assess, come on, comes and assess and says, yes, we agree that this is uh, the repair that's needed. Mm. It'll come back to this amount. If you can raise the amount here, go ahead and repair and then we'll check it off from your rent. How do you see that happening? Uh, the people who make those decisions yeah. probably still live in some of these houses. Yeah. <laughs> yes. How do you think they're going to do it? Remember, mm. we went to understand these things, please understand how the government has managed its property and its assets. Mm. The entire upper hill was civil servants' houses, senior civil servants, PSs and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. We know it's part of the CBD now, okay? Mm -hmm. And a lot of those plots were not an acre. A good number of them were two acres. Hmm. Now, advice from World Bank and IMF, 
you know sometimes you look at the thinking behind some of these people <laughs> who lend us money and they're lending us money now mm. okay mm. so a lot of the decisions that are being made are coming from them mm. Mm. you have to ask the question <laughs> are these things really meant to make our lives yeah. better mm. huh? or to keep you in a state of constant want yes yes there are bank after all because if we're having this conversation we're having <laughs> we cannot leave out the health sector why are we suddenly having problems that have never existed in the health sector this issue of internships it's it we've had in terms for as long as we can remember why are we having a problem now mm. is it really a problem that the ministry of health has or is it a problem that is beyond them i can't understand how what in my mind seems to be a fairly straightforward issue has become so convoluted so complicated yes yeah i mean fingers will keep pointing at the minister is this thing really within her purview or is this something that is beyond her <coughs> one would have to look at that and up. she's also twisting and turning and figuring out what to do mm. no 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 i yeah. i still insist a minister comes and just gives policy directions all right yes the technical people who work in that ministry are the ones who actually run things the ones who run and, and have been good, running it and it's good to be having there. the director general of health because the director general of health is on who's actually running that ministry in terms of in terms of the policy direction and all those things about health but so it doesn't matter which minister comes in there's some things that are just obvious we cannot be having a conversation about why are we calling you an intern <laughs> when you are you are a doctor you have a license uh, yeah, for oh, goodness uh, sake uh, you, you if you're an intern and then we have another intern here who's in administration this intern in administration is getting paid uh, 10,000 shillings and we have a government internship program why are we paying you for 7,000 uh, so we don't want you so move. we want to call you something else or we lay that bring it down but uh, give me a break son anyway can you always um, last year, remember, they're still in the loss-making era in mm. terms of net loss, mm -hmm. okay? But last year's loss was 38.2 billion shillings. This year, that loss has reduced to 22.6 billion shillings. That's a 40.6% 40, 40. drop in net loss. And the net loss is coming because of other factors. However, the sales for Kenya Airways have gone up by 52.8%. They sold 178 point four billion shillings. In this year is a part of re re rebuilding their roots network and capacity from the depths of the COVID-19 pandemic that disrupted the aviation sector. KQ recorded an improvement in operational results which were however wiped out by losses on foreign exchange and early lease terminations. The airline posted an operating profit of 10 billion shillings for the full year. 10 billion shillings operating profit reversing uh, an operating loss of 5.6 billion shillings last year so they've moved basically from operations a loss of 5 billion to a profit of 10 billion they reflected the faster growth in revenue compared to operating costs the company however plunged into a net loss due to additional costs linked to borrowing foreign exchange movements lease terminations among others those costs increased to 33 billion from 32 billion shillings the impressive performance was, however, dampened by the 24 billion impact on foreign exchange losses, according to KQ in a statement. The shares of the NSE remain suspended. KQ has been increasing its capacity steadily following the resumption of the global travel. So it's that a mix of you're making more money, but mm. there's still these other historical loss issues. That are still there yeah, and then look plaguing, yeah. look at the 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 foreign exchange and what it did mm. and then there's also that that's impacting it uh okay alan kilavuka the ceo will come and uh, tell us more about this yeah, on thursday morning mm. so we can get to understand more and more about what's happening Sindio. Uh, david says we are broke with a capital b but the government will not say it the talk is that the shilling has strengthened and the economy is stabilizing it sounds better we are due to grow by seven percent mm. in the next two years or so so uh, it's all looking all rosy but the children are not getting the quality education they deserve because capitation has been delayed the counties are not delivering because money is delayed in disbursement Roads are not being built because contractors are off-site, because they have not been paid. Okay. 
What's the true situation? Anyway, keep it here for more conversations. In the next hour, we ask you, what's your plan? How do you plan for whatever? If it's retirement, if it's something major that you want to do next year, if it's education, if it's a new project, if it's how do you plan for it and how can you get support in getting this done? This is a conversation that I'll be having with the boss of ICEA Lion Trust. Good morning. It's 7 a.m. up your life. Good morning, this is the news wire. Amla Ubaga. President William Ritter says his government won't relent in the fight against alcohol and drug abuse as it is robbing the country of its working force. Ritter said the fight against alcohol and drug abuse won't stop until the war is won. We are also intentional on dealing with those who want to corrupt our young people with drugs, with illicit brews. And we have put down our foot that it cannot be business as usual. We cannot have a drinking nation. We must have a working nation. And it, cannot, it cannot be both ways. In different events in Nyandaro County, Deputy President Rigada Gashago has continued to warn security officers who are negligent in the fight against illegal alcohol and drugs, saying that they'll be punished in accordance to the law. And our security team, the new county commissioner and your team, you have the law now. You are good. Please do your work. Mufanya kazi bana. Eh, nasi tumakubaliana. Hakuna transfer. Mutu wakishi tuwana kazi, anafutiwa tu hapa. Marori ya kupeleta misiko, imejaba Nyandaro. Please, and you are doing a good job. Carry on. Interior Cabinet Secretary Kithure Kindiki while in Narok reiterated that the sale of alcohol near educational institutions and places of worship won't be allowed. We have a national campaign which is relentless and permanent and we will continue crushing drug cartels and people who are selling poison to the people of Kenya. We will continue crushing them mercilessly. And we are not going to listen to any voice, any distraction. We will remain focused. And here in Narok, already good progress has been made. It is prohibited for an alcoholic outlet to be next to an education institution or a place of worship. Health Cabinet Secretary Susan Nahumicha has been summoned by the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission in approve into hiring a politically connected PR firm to handle Afia House matters. Nahumicha is alleged to have breached the Public Procurement and Disposal Act 2015 guidelines in awarding Crestwood a lucrative communication tender worth millions. You're being warned against failing to, absor to observe uh, traffic rules, especially if you're a pedestrian. The National Transport and Safety Authority says they are out to arrest individuals who will not use footbridges, walkways and other designated crossing points in a bid to maintain road safety. This event comes as the authority arrested several people yesterday. Rongo University has been closed indefinitely over student unrest following a hotly contested election. The university senate held an emergency meeting with the situation when the situation at the university got out of hand and spiraled into running battles with police officers. Following the incident, all students were directed to vacate the university premises immediately. Rongo University's VC, Professor Samuel Gudu, said tensions had been building at the institution as students as students selected their new leaders. Kenya's troubled flag carrier Kenya Airways says it has recorded an operating profit in 2023 in its first in seven years. The figure of 10.5 billion Kenya shillings for the year ended December 31st represents a sharp turnaround from an operating loss of 5.6 billion shillings in 2022, which Chairman Michael Joseph hailing it 
with Chairman Michael Joseph hailing it as a significant milestone. The airline, whose biggest shareholder is the Kenyan government, also said in a statement that its loss after tax had reduced to almost 23 billion shillings from more than 38 billion shillings the year before. That's the Newswire. I'm Lea Ubaga. Spice FM, Nakuru. Okay, it's a few minutes after 7 o'clock and there's traffic. It's coming in heavy on the Thicker Superhighway all the way from the Outer Ring Junction. It's going to take us into the CBD uh, via Moranga Road. And then getting on to Wangari Mathai, not so bad. Limuru Road has some traffic, as does Kambu Road. And uh, when 30 minutes ago nothing was happening, well, there you have it. Traffic really everywhere you look right about now on James Gishiro. It's heavy as you get towards Waiaki Way. And there's some traffic that's coming off um, out of Westlands. Let's look at Ngong Road, where there's a little bit of it coming off of Naivasha Road, and then it's going to come through towards the city, and on this other side of things, where the Eastern Bypass was giving some traffic, Outer Ring also has some, as you then approach that Donholm um, Junction. Um, but apart from that, I think that's what we're seeing for now. It's going to get heavier, that's for sure, as we come round to traffic hour. Where are you this morning? Let us know. If you're stuck somewhere, you find a good route, let's talk on Spice of MKE on X, hashtag The Situation Room. This is The Situation Room, the home of hard-hitting political commentary and penetrating insights about the state of the nation. This is a talk radio experience like no other. The Situation Room, a place for hard truths, debates, and elevated conversations. The Situation Room, witty, political, engaging, deep, controversial. In the room, we have C.T. Muga, researcher, academic, seasoned political observer, a fountain of wisdom in these politically uncertain times. Ndu Oko, Nigerian by birth, Kenyan by choice, communications expert, Pan-Africanist, a truth seeker and believer in people power, and Eric Latin, agent provocateur, the man in the chair, seasoned journalist, news hound, a man who believes in punching up not down. Coming up to seven after seven. This Good morning is the welcome Situation Room. The, the, the situation only room. way to... Thank you very much, everybody who's tuned in on Spice FM across the country. And those who are joining us on KTN Home now, those who've been with us on YouTube and those who are tuning in onto YouTube now on Facebook, wherever we're having our conversations, even on X, Asante Sana. We're here until 10 a.m. every weekday morning. And this is the Safari Rally Weekend. People will just be up and down, going into, you know, into Naivasha, into Nakuru. If you're on those sides and you'd like to go to Lanet and see this thing that we've been talking about, Serenity Springs in Lanet, please just make your way there. Oh, if you'd like to go today, it's okay. Transport is available from 7.30 a.m. at Kenkom House and at 8.30 a.m. at West what? Side. Yes. <laughs> West Side Mall in Nakuru <laughs> County. They will take you to Lanet. Serenity Springs, and who's they? They is Username Investments Limited. They'll take you there. You will see. They'll you'll see what they've been talking about. They've bought a huge piece of land. They've subdivided it into eight acre plots. They have gone all the way into processing the title deeds. Titles are ready. They have done the perimeter wall. They have done a gate. They have sunk a borehole. They have pulled power. They have done the roads inside. All they're saying is come. And in fact, even they've even done the master planning for the entire estate. They have left many green spaces and even common areas. Just come. How much is it? An acre, an eighth of an acre? An eighth of an acre is one million four hundred and ninety nine thousand Kenyan shillings. One million four hundred and ninety nine thousand Kenyan shillings. Kenyan shillings. Yes. How do you pay? Well, it depends. Mm -hmm. If you happen to have the entire amount, well, that is the amount you will have to pay. Mm -hmm. If you cannot, then you are able to pay in three months installments. Six months, nine months, 12 months. But the thing that must be noted is that this is it. Mm. The amount that you are asked to pay is it. You will not be shocked and surprised by new charges, things that have come up. The you owe, you uh, know. Uh, uh. Uh-uh, uh-uh, dollars, <laughs> none of that stuff. You count as a count to a mesemas, do you fence, lazy my, uh-uh. Mm-mm, you lazy my, uh-uh, 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 none of those stories. 
pay 1.499 get your title yes and that's it's as good as that yes and then start building keep it as an investment whatever all these things sometimes require planning okay yes, they do and uh, we'll be talking about planning shortly let me just tell you how to get in touch with username investment what's the number zero seven two five triple zero triple two very good okay. and if you can sms the word plot and send it to Z uh, two zero three two one very good <laughs> two zero three two one plot send they'll call you i do not take a plot ah my friend you, you too. and you too to Konayo. <laughs> what is your plan uh, are you planning to buy a plot like this one in serenity springs if they go today and you didn't have the money okay it's okay maybe you're even thinking okay i have i can raise 149,900 now i just need to think about how i can raise the other money within the next 12 months how do you plan for that okay maybe i have the money now i can buy the plot but then i'd like to build pesa sasa ya kujenga hey need a tour work what is your plan our next guest is going to help you think through your plan peter washira is the ceo of ica lion trust he's our next guest good morning peter good morning eric welcome to the hot seat of the situation room thank you thank you mm -hmm. we had to plan to have you here today <laughs> <laughs> what was your plan that was a good plan <laughs> <laughs> you'll be telling us a lot more about this right financial goals to secure your future how do you set those goals how do you then actualize those goals before we get to that conversation the gentleman has the day's proverb this week the proverbs are from the island republic of mauritius and you told us the capital is called port what louis 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 no. not lewis louis l o u i s uh, that one not l e w okay is the s silent, silent. yes it is <laughs> <laughs> you really are not all together here my friends <laughs> Uh, mm. Island. Island. Ah, yeah. yes. Okay. Uh -huh. Sour kabisa. What is the proverb? The proverb mm. is a simple, straightforward one. Mm. The cleverness of one alone is a shallow well that soon dries up. The cleverness of one alone is a shallow well that soon dries up. Mm. Peter, how do you interpret this proverb? The cleverness of one alone is a shallow well. Wow, okay. That's 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 an interesting one. <laughs> it, soon dry, it soon dries up. It soon dries up. Mm. Yes. Yeah. If you don't have a plan, mm. your aspirations may soon dry up. Mm. If you don't talk to people who can help you think through your plan. That's right. If this cleverness is just yours alone, ah mimi na jua kujenga tu. Sikununua tu mawe moja 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 moja. <laughs> but if you talk if you have others helping you then you make your well deeper or oh, you talk That's to right. people who've mm -hmm. been in the business of planning for a very long time mm -hmm. so they understand how to traverse the variety of terrains that you may come across yes ah yes mm -hmm. then that is a combined cleverness and yes. you're most likely to succeed yes yes peter let's start with the from the very beginning i see a lion we see yeah. i see a lion group we see i see a lion trust Okay, what is it? I see a lion is a group of financial services companies with a very long history. Mm. Um, actually, a history that dates way back to the beginning of insurance in this part of the world in East Africa, mm. back in the 1890s. This year, we are celebrating 60 years of the life business but the general business is much older than that mm -hmm. there are two other businesses the ICA Lion asset management mm -hmm. and the ICA Lion trust company mm -hmm. both of which are about 40 years today mm -hmm. it's a group that um, has touched many lives for many decades um, bringing forth solutions that are fast in the market and what we are celebrating is that very long journey of helping customers achieve their aspirations a continuing legacy that continues to unfold for many generations to come mm. what does the trust company do the trust company is uh, 
was was started as an interesting journey. It's actually what part of the response that um, the group had in some of the solutions that were being provided. Mm. Back in the 80s, um, the mother company then, which was the life business, realized that um, when you provide solutions, life insurance solutions to your clients, and unfortunately, someone who is in my age passes on, you have young children, mm. what would be the outcome? You would pay the benefit to the next of kin. Mm. But they realize quickly that that is not providing the solution that the family is needed. Mm. Because once you pay X amount of money to the next of kin, they may not have the capacity to provide that. Take care of the young children who have been left behind, some of them at birth, for the next 20 plus years. Mm. So they started a department called Employee Benefit Trustees then to hold that kitty, administer it, and direct it to taking care of the families. It was another first in the industry then, mm. and that has moved um, into the asset management and the trust company. So the trust company has been managing trusts for families uh, over those years. We have moved now into managing generational wealth, mm. you know, helping families realize aspiration that is beyond your lifetime. Mm. That's good. And that's what you know, we talk about planning and thinking about your future because you're thinking today um, and there are very many years to come and you don't know what happens tomorrow, what happens thereafter. And in your absence, you do not want your dream to be buried with you and not benefit your dependence for a long time to come and this is why now you come in that's right okay but what did you experience because it is clear that from the life department you did experience certain things meaning someone say passes away when they're actually fairly youthful yeah and there's this huge lump sum that then goes to the family that's right what was the experience because for you to come up with this idea of the trust where yes there's the money but it's being managed to ensure that the aspirations are actually met what had you seen when these payouts were made well when uh, someone is taking any sort of financial solution or yes. financial plan mm. insurance cover what they have in mind is that i am managing a risk that may unfold sometimes in the future mm. I am uh, protecting my family from financial hardship if I am not there. So I take a cover to protect against that. So in the unfortunate scenario of my demise, the expectation would be that that kitty would take care of the needs of my family. Yes. So the experience was that the practice then was you pay to the, the family members, the mm -hmm. next of kin, some X amount of money, you have young children who need to be taken care of for more than 20 years. The next one kin have no experience on how to receive that money, manage it, and stretch it. For 20 years. For 20 yeah. years. So the experience was that they would show up, sometimes a few months down the road, <laughs> and say, Kuna kitu <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and uh, we are in the business of providing holistic solutions mm. that protects, but at the same time, provide total solution that would meet that protection. Mm. Even as you say this, I think a lot of the fear that is met by people is, um, is what I have today enough to be able to do what you're talking about? And I think we're getting to the t time now we can debunk a lot of these things whereby before it was, okay, it's insurance and these sleazy guys who are trying to come after my money and I don't know what it is that they're doing with it. Or from what you're saying now, where you actually say, look, the little that you have, let's see how we can help you put it away to be able to do this. So people's fear is, I don't have enough or whatever I have. I don't see that coming together to help me later in the future. Can you disabuse that? There is never a point of I don't have enough. You can always begin from where you are. Um, within the IC Alliance group, you can actually begin a plan with as low as 500 shillings. Sometimes 
even with some of the trust solutions, you can actually even just set, set up an account and start building it up mm -hmm. in anticipation that that solution will come to meet a certain need in the future. Mm -hmm. I can give you an example. Mm -hmm. um, most of us who are parents, um, there are certain needs that you have to take care of, you know, uh, financial obligations yep. in our children's life. Mm. You know, uh, I'll get married, I don't have children, but I know when I have children, probably there's a gap of about three, four years until they start going to school. Mm -hmm. So I'll take a life cover mm -hmm. to make sure that by the time they're going to school, I have a solution to take care of their schooling education. But I can also take up a trust to start building it up so that the moment they start going to school, that mm. trust can continue immediately, start, uh, begin to take care of the education needs. Mm. So that now, when the child is getting into different stages of their life, you know, they're going to high school, they're mm. going to university, you can match solutions that will mature at that stages. But today, you can actually now start up a trust and start building it up to match your regular monthly income with the irregular liability that will be needed probably every four months. Mm. Okay, this is interesting. Mm. What does this look like now when we're talking about a trust? Because you know, yeah. previously it's like you know you put a certain amount per month and let's see how what you get at the end of the day. Right. But when you say a trust, what does that mean? Like you, you put some money in? And then you keep adding to it to build up the pool. What exactly does this trust look like? How does it mature? Who manages it? Who makes sure now that when this child gets to school, they can now start? Because these are some of the things that plague people, isn't it? That's Health, right. education. That's right. Right? So how, how would this work exactly? A trust is one of the most versatile solutions that you can set up. Mm -hmm. It depends on the purpose that you want to place around it. So you can set up a trust that will start taking care of your needs immediately. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're saying, my child's school fees is 50,000 Kenya shillings. Mm -hmm. And I know I'll pay that school fees in four months' time. Mm -hmm. I say, my income is coming in every month. I can split that 50,000 into four portions mm -hmm. and say, every month I want to put aside some, say, 20,000 shillings. Mm -hmm. So that by the time the school fees is due, I'll only send instructions to the trust and tell them, pay 50,000. Okay. So what I have done is that instead of running to the circles every time school fees is due, mm -hmm. I have already matched the income that is coming in every month with that liability that I know will disrupt me four months down the line. Okay, what's the difference between that and just put opening a savings account? Mm. The difference is that a trust is a controlled structure mm -hmm. meaning that the purpose for which you have set it for is what the trust will meet ah, i see so it sort of helps you to be disciplined mm. towards the purpose that you want to meet mm. so a savings um anyone can actually come in and you know you want to treat your kids on a pizza dip in <laughs> next month i'll put in a bit more that's right <laughs> <laughs> so you can actually set up that's one example of a trust that's right where you're saying i have uh immediate future needs and i'm planning towards that so i can put in money for it that's right like we are saying oh you want to build a house and you're looking at it in the next two years i want to raise x amount of money or i want to be uh, there are milestones Mawe, x amount month five month seven x amount so you start putting in money towards it and that it'll if it's a house project that money will stay there and you'll only release that money if it is a house project that's right you can achieve that through mm. a trust but you can also achieve that through an investment solution okay. which also ICLIN provides okay yeah does a trust come with interest yes it does oh, it does so it's accruing interest it's accruing interest on and the, one of the biggest advantages that a trust gives you is that because the needs that you want to meet with it can be very closely pr be predicted, you can actually match the investment vehicles to give you a very solid investment return. Because you know you'll not touch that money probably for the next 10 you know, years, 5 10 years, years mm -hmm. or even 4 months. You can actually match investment solutions to direct to that need. 
the other the other advantage would be that you almost can predict how much will be paid out of your trust kitty mm. so meaning that you can match your investment profile mm. to be geared towards the liabilities that you're meeting and the timelines within which they come to you so what i'm hearing here is you know many times when you hear uh, insurance companies you're thinking insurance you're thinking in the event of the unforeseen uh, insurance for health it's in the event you fall sick insurance life is in the event you go under you know all those things so here we are saying it's actually thinking about even your daily life That's right. you can plan and you can get solutions that help you in your planning right that's right and the future here because our conversation today is about the right financial goals to secure your future future does not have to be when you are 80. a future is you decide you determine your future it's a future of four months it's a future of 10 months it's a future of one year of 10 years or 15 years that's depending right. on the particular goal can you mix trusts let's say i'm putting this money here it and this idea and i'm in a family after 10 years i'll decide whether i want it to be to pay for these children or i just don't like the children anymore i'll now put that money into <laughs> <laughs> traveling the world <laughs> can you <laughs> yes you, you you can you can uh, create different purposes within the same trust mm. um uh, in fact when you're talking about the future you can actually control that future and when that future happens in fact the trust is the only solution where you can actually direct what happens 300 years from now through uh, our family trusts mm -hmm. generational wealth mm. where you've actually protected generational wealth and you're saying that i would want my family portfolio to be held in a secure kitty and to take care of the generations to come and to support the growth of the family wealth into generations that's so assuming that, yes that the, the insurance the financial institution will be around for the next 300 years isn't it maybe or maybe not mm. because you see a trust is like a legal person that you're creating mm. the financial the corporate trustee who would come to provide you the trust mm. comes in as a service provider mm. to you so when you're setting up a trust you can put conditions that says if this corporate trustee is not there how are they succeeded by another one? Mm. Mm -hmm. How are they succeeded with probably even someone from the family? Because you may have situations where, you know, the next generation are not interested in the family wealth, so you protect that wealth within the, a trust. Mm. But maybe the third generation, the fourth generation, someone will come up and they will actually step into the shoes of the family. Let me explain where my mind is going with this we've had financial institutions in this country that are also in the insurance business who have not fared well in their business that's true okay that is putting it as politely as i possibly can so are we saying that some of their activities were taken over by other entities who of a similar nature or are we saying that within the structure of these institutions there is an understood provision that guarantees that even if they cease to exist as the entities that they were that someone else or some other entity will take over their functions this is what we're saying that's that's what you're saying that the financial solutions that you put in place yes. are independent of the service providers that are providing that mm. uh, in fact the kitty that is held in trust is not part of the balance sheet of the company providing that service no it is not eh? it is not it is an independent kitty and this company is actually providing services mm. so that if that company ceases to exist another one can simply step in with the whole portfolio secure and continue discharging their let mandates me ask this question then that comes to mind now this is purely from a point of ignorance there is a term i hear being used in that industry it's called reinsurance yes what exactly is it and how does it come to play in this situation reinsurance is a very good um structure you can talk about it as insuring insurance okay so the basic level is where an insurance company like the ICA Lion group mm. whether it's a life or the general insurance company mm. provides the cover mm. but ordinarily an insurance company may not have the capacity to provide excessive risk that may unfold from that mm. so insurance businesses would also go ahead and also cover themselves 
through a third party okay. insurer who is now the reinsurer are they people who reinsure the reinsurance companies yes you can actually lay it in such a way that the risk is protected totally all the way to global insurance uh, capacity provisions so the only time that you may be a total risk is if the planet earth collapses completely if the dinosaurs come back <laughs> 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 Let's take a break. That is half past seven. Peter Washira is the CEO of ICA Lion Trust, and he's our guest this morning. We are talking about the right financial goals to secure your future. What's your plan? ICA Lion has decided, you know what, um, for a long time, uh, insurance companies have just been coming up with a product and telling you, hey, get into this box, okay? Find your corner within this box. Oh, ye box, Nindogo Sana, I am too tall. Fanya Evi, my friend, squat, you'll fit in the box. <laughs> now they've decided, no, 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 no. Come. No matter how tall you are, no matter how wide you are, <laughs> you come and then we'll make a box that fits you. Mm. See, dear? That's right. And that's where when they say, what's your plan? We will then create a product that customizes to your plan. Everybody has a plan and the people's plans are different. What's your plan? I see a lion says, come. Let's work together on it. We'll be back shortly. This is the Situation Room, the only way to start your day. Embark on an unforgettable journey through the heart of Africa at the Festac Africa Festival 2024, destination Kisumu. Join us from May 20th to 26th for Africa's celebration of global culture, fashion, music, dance, and more. Immerse yourself in a week-long extravaganza featuring professionals from across the continent as we explore the theme of sustainable growth trajectory for Africa through culture, trade, travel, and tourism. Don't miss this opportunity to experience the vibrant diversity and boundless energy of Africa in just seven days. Waruakidala. Looking for top tier sheet metal design and fabrication services? Look no further. Duff Engineering in Nairobi offers premium solutions for cable management systems, electrical switchboards, streetlight poles, and more. With cutting-edge technology and a commitment to excellence, we ensure your project meets exact specifications. Call Purity Kifinji at 0113-170-654 or email sales at duffengineering.co.ke. Visit us at 11 Kitui Road off Kampala Road, Industrial Area. Your satisfaction is our priority. Visit www. DuffEngineering.co.ke today. All right, we're looking at cloudy conditions in Nairobi this morning. We'll see highs of 24 and lows of 16. We're looking into a partly sunny Nakuru at 18 with highs of 29, and we'll see highs of 25 in a partly sunny Nyeri at 18. It's 18 and sunny in Eldoret with highs of 26 and lows of 14. All right, looking into Mombasa, it's partly sunny at 27 with highs of 33, and we'll see highs of 33 as well in a sunny Malindi currently at 29. Kisumu's cloudy at 22, and Kakamega at 19 is cloudy. Kampala cloudy at 21 with highs of 27 and Dar es Salaam is sunny at 25 going to highs of 32 Johannesburg sunny at 14 with highs of 25 while Mogadishu is sunny at 29 with highs of 34 Addis Ababa sunny at 15 with highs of 22 while into uh, Lagos clear at 28 with highs of 34 and rain showers continue in Kinshasa at 26 with highs of 33 and lows of 25 
morning, your life. It's the middle of the week and we're looking at traffic coming in on the Thicker Superhighway. Uh, we're only looking at it right from the Outer Ring Junction. Before that, you're going to come all the way in from the Eastern Bypass through Roiru, through Roiru and then out towards uh, Kenyatta University. When you get stuck there at the Outer Ring Junction, traffic is bumper to bumper all the way through towards the junction that leads to Moranga Road or goes to Wangari Mathai. Okay, Kiambu Road, also some traffic there. It's bumper to bumper. We're coming just past DCI with that. Um, coming off of Waiaki Way, some traffic. It's heavy coming off Dennis Pritt, and then you're going to connect at some point through towards Lavington and then out at Mzima Springs. And then there's incoming traffic on James Gishiro. All of that then meets at Waiaki Way. Let's take a look at what's coming off Mombasa Road, and not much actually. You should be fine for most parts of it. Gong Road coming in at that junction that goes towards Community, coming in from Rilo Dingaway, and then out towards Valley Road some traffic there as well traffic is building up just as fast as i'm talking this morning so let's see what happens as we get into traffic our proper we'll talk spice of mke on x hashtag the situation room mature intelligent talk every morning spice up yourself Mornings done right. 94.4 Spice FM, Nairobi. CEO ICA Lion Trust, the right financial goals to secure your future. And the future here, we've said you can determine how, how, how far off is your future. You know, sometimes people think future, you're thinking old age. That's what you see future. But future can be anything, Peter, like you've said. That's right. Future could be uh, in the next financial year, future could be four months from today. Future could be a continuous thing, a present continuous future. Mm, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, and it could be any of those things. But then, when you think about the various solutions, and I want you to just give us the differences in these solutions. So sometimes you think about insurance as an insurance product. So you've bought an insurance product. That's right. You also said you can buy an investment plan and get into an investment plan. You've also said you can also get into a trust. What's the difference between these? Or are they one and the same thing, just using different terminologies depending on the time of day? Fantastic. They are solutions structured to meet different needs in the life of our customer. In, in the ICA Lion Group, we have a mantra where we say that we exist to help our customers grow, um, uh, create, grow, protect and preserve your wealth mm. so meaning that in all that uh, spectrum you can actually have different solutions to meet very specific needs mm -hmm. and, and it's the beauty of what you have craft crafted within the ICLIN group where as a group we are not saying that we want to sell to you products and for you to fit into it mm -hmm. in fact this campaign is sort of like a bold statement telling you let's First of all, look at what your needs are. What's mm. your plan? Mm. Uh, and then we will now work together to actually help you achieve those, those plans. So uh, just like the way we are all different, mm. our aspirations are all different. Mm -hmm. Your plan should also be different and very unique to you. How can we work together to actually meet those very specific needs? Mm. Why do you choose to use this approach? Well, because I think um, it is apt. Um, I, I look at it this way. Life is beautiful and colorful, and we all experience the beauty of life in our own different ways. Um, and the traditional insurance of financial services has been you want to fit everyone within the box. Mm. But you're saying that your box may look different. It doesn't have to be rectangle or square. It could be triangle mm. and we want you to experience that to its fullness so i think the approach is that boldness to say we have we all have dreams that are very unique to us mm. and they are very colorful and they're beautiful dreams how can we work together to actually help you meet those very specific dreams mm. okay so i have various many dreams but I am the same guy with a limited income That's right. and limited disposable uh, income. So let's say I only have, I can, I can get 6K, all 
okay. but i have various things i want my children to go to, go to school and good schools i have to look at you know, the future in case i die i'm thinking about okay so uh, i'd like to invest i'd like to build a family home in future and all those things but i have the six care and you're telling me you know we can fit and tailor make all these things into various solutions how would you work it out would you like say so this one fits its investment so let's put 2000 here this one fits into trust so let's put 1337 here how would you do it because i'll come to you with my full list of all my needs and, and my plans and your 6000 yes. and my 6000 yes. yeah <laughs> papit that's an interesting one um we will want to have a conversation where the conversation is around what is it that you want to achieve and how can we plan the 6000 shillings to achieve certain goals that you have of course within reality realms mm. um and within those dreams you probably may have you want to build a savings kitty mm. so we we'll tell you you actually only need as little as 500 shillings to start a digi trust account mm -hmm. a money market account mm -hmm. which is way within the 6000 shillings mm -hmm. you also have kids that you want to educate how much school fees will you be paying in the next x period so you may split that into i want an education cover or I want an insurance cover how does that work how much Mm -hmm. can i afford with within my 6000 shillings mm -hmm. to take care of uh, my education my children's education needs in the next you know x number of years mm -hmm. but i also need to pay school fees today mm -hmm. how do i match that with the medium term or long term needs so you can take an insurance cover but at the same time you can also take an education trust that now starts taking care of those education needs mm -hmm. today mm -hmm. you know you may have other needs probably like traveling and you're saying in part of part of my investment kitty mm -hmm. i know uh there's a part that i want to set up as a buffer that i can access probably you know in a very short term yeah but at the same time i'm looking at a holiday at the end of the year mm -hmm. what would be the other medium term solution that i can actually take up we can accommodate all that as part of a conversation to specifically meet the specific needs that you have will you help me prioritize because it sounds like you know we have to now look at all these things which one is the highest priority which one is the lower will, will you help me with that that, that will be yes part of the conversation that part we'll of the conversation yeah. then the next bit will be discipline we are in disciplined people and you know that it's like worth a six thousand pallet and jesus i'm going to could i share it here and then Mm -hmm. 6000 and 5200 <laughs> how would you help me maintain that discipline that if it's 6000 it's 6000 and if i ever get an extra and i can actually make it 7000 then it can also get into this kit that's right the discipline is actually achieved by the kind of solutions that you take up there are solutions where for example the solution that allows you to access your money almost immediately but the other solutions that somehow controls that access in a way that you can uh, put in an investment kitty that would say you cannot access that kitty in you know an x amount of time there are other solutions like a trust that would say you set up a trust specifically to take care of education so when you come with a request to go on holiday the trust cannot pay you <laughs> so you basically control that discipline because it's a legal agreement we have with you mm -hmm. and this agree legal agreement is actually around the discipline of taking care of that specific need that you've you've put in place okay yeah this is interesting because like you know with life you cannot really predict what is going to happen so again coming back to the trust matter and saying okay so essentially what we're doing is curating solutions for folks who may sometime in the future not be there right. who's then to be sure or how does it happen that in the situation whereby you the principal yeah. is not there yeah. and the trust for whom it's been set up children whatever yeah. that they can actually be guaranteed that their needs will be taken care of for which the trust was set up in the first place who guarantees that um, who's going to manage it who's going to take care of it who's going to be how 
will you how, how will you go knowing or be sure mm -hmm. that you know you will actually handle the matters of the trust mm -hmm. that the children for whom it's been set up will get what they need without any other kind of interference all right fantastic let me let me, let me respond with an example mm -hmm. you have taken over an insurance cover uh, of let's say five thousand mm. uh, or five million can shilling that's a maturity value mm. or that's a sum assured and you've passed on probably before the policy has matured mm -hmm. and the sum assured is payable to take care of a young child somewhere yeah so what we do is that we will take that money work together with the guardian of that child take the money put it in a trust account and then we'll be working together with the guardian to make sure that the needs of that child will be met. Mm -hmm. And the way it is met, mm -hmm. and probably that is where now the guarantee comes in, mm -hmm. is that if you're taking care of Medicare or school fees, mm -hmm. you will not draw the money and send it to the guardian. The guardian will facilitate, but mm -hmm. will, the trust will pay directly to the school or directly to the hospital. Okay. So what it's providing is a very accountable framework mm. to make sure that the money is not misdirected to other needs. Okay, because people can be refrafts. That's right. <laughs> okay. But this is the thing, and I think because th these are the practical things that we're talking about because people think, okay, well, I can get into something like this, but how would it work? So sometimes you will have an, a medical emergency. Emergency, by definition, doesn't give you time to prepare. That's right. Money is in a trust. The guardian is with this child today. Yeah. They're in hospital. Can you ring up the trust and say this is where we are? Because this money that's in the trust essentially was meant for situations such as this. Yeah. Do trusts deal with emergencies? Do you yeah. deal with and so can you ring up the, your trust manager? Is yes, there somebody can. like that? We've actually and experienced say, that. So can we many deal? Times. Mm. So many times. What, what happens is that uh, you can immediately ring the trust and tell them uh, the child is in the hospital. Mm. Uh, he needs to be treated. So what we do is that we immediately give uh, an undertaking to the hospital, tell them that this is our child. Mm -hmm. uh, please go ahead, take care of all their medical needs, okay. and we'll take care of the bill once they are well, yeah. up to this X amount, because that's the amount that is available within the trust. Mm -hmm. So that now mm -hmm. there is no delay in mm -hmm. providing the need that is needed in that mm -hmm. child's life. These trusts... Is it one thing, is it the same thing that you talked about, you know, protecting generational wealth? If I died and left five million shillings in a trust, yes. how long will the five million remain as five million? So there are different structures that you can create within a trust. Mm. So you can create a trust that uh, can be wound up at a certain stage. For example, if you are creating a trust for the education of the children, mm. By the age of 25, those children would have gone through education all the way to mm -hmm. university. Yep. So you can say at that age, then the money is available to be given back to the beneficiary for, for them to start off life. Is it the same amount? Uh, is, is, if I set up a trust for 5 million shillings, yes. uh, but you know, by the time the last born is who died, who, who was about a year, ago a, a year old when I was dying by the time they are finishing 25 education will have changed things will have changed that's right is this thing growing in wealth to retain its value of 5 million or equivalent it, it is growing it is being reinvested mm. and what we do is that we work with families to make sure that the goal is to actually stretch that 5 million to fully meet the needs of that child so they actually scenarios where in the early ages of the child, the amount payable may not be that high. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you may find that what you're actually utilizing is the interest mm -hmm. that the five million is earning. Mm -hmm. So by the time they go to the higher levels of education, the fees considerably go up. Mm -hmm. So you probably may start, you know, getting into eating the capital mm -hmm. plus the interest. Mm -hmm. We've actually had scenarios where by the time the kid is actually finishing, you probably have sometimes even more than the five million that was put in mm -hmm. yet they have been fully educated through the interest that has been earned mm -hmm. or scenarios where of course the higher education was higher uh, was was a little bit more expensive it has eaten into part of the capital 
but the money is still conserved so that by the time they are hitting 25 there's still a substantial amount that they can actually start off life with oh, i see yet all their education needs have been fully met this is very interesting this trust thing is very interesting <laughs> so <laughs> who if in the event that you don't want or an individual would rather like i said people can be riffraffs and you would rather that the trust manager handles this for you and because they know the ages of your children and all of this and that uh, unless you know if somebody's taking care of them they can come to you but in terms of management of the actual funds yes. can the trust manager handle that completely and then now make sure that look we will be then the ones to alert you or inform you when one two three is due or that we can do a payout or even be aware that this child now is an adult yeah. and then can have access to this funds for their living and things like that yes we we can actually handle that entirely mm. we can actually but in most cases mm. we want to work together with the family sure because this child is living with a guardian somewhere yeah yeah and and you want to make sure that the person who is living with a child is actually involved in the journey of taking care of the child mm. so what you're trying to do is to protect the child and protect the guardian by making sure that we have a scenario that directs the finances to the needs of the child mm. but working together with the guardian mm. yeah i think it's also important because you know here's here's i think uh, a, a real great opportunity to be lead a uh, lead in this space where we all operate and where we say you know what eat the thing today but there's an opportunity for you to to start to put something away and before it has been the conversation has been put something away so that you have something to live on tomorrow that's right but if what I hear you saying is that through all of these avenues that ICA has, for example, what it is is that put a little something so that you can live life. Yeah. And I think that has changed in its dimension because you can do so many things at the same time by putting a little bit of something away. That's right. That's right. You, you can actually enjoy life in its entirety in its entirety mm. no matter what level of society you are at mm. there is a solution for almost everything you know that you can actually enjoy life of course there there there, there are situations where you need to be disciplined mm. in certain areas yeah. and will help you to actually be empowered to know where do i need to keep some discipline and why do i need to you know loosen up a bit mm. but it's possible to actually enjoy life and i think that is the dream of this campaign that life is not just one color mm. Mm. it's beautiful and there are very many angles to it and we are all different and we need to enjoy the full the fullness of all the colors that life brings mm. to us you know there's a uh, always this daunting statistic that we deal with when we talk about financial services and we start with how many kenyans of working age actually have a bank account we forget we don't even go to insurance numbers aren't very encouraging then you come to insurance i'm not sure how encouraging it is now we're talking about trust funds now all these things when i hear them being spoken of the thing that strikes me is this is knowledge somebody needs to have when they're very young you don't wait until someone starts working they've acquired some nasty habits of mishandling their money and then you are running interference against their habits with this new idea of you know put your money here and they've already decided where they want their money to go mm. that's right should these things be part and parcel of the growing process of a young person so that they know that these options exist long before they even start acquiring or making money so when they make money they have an idea because once you allow me to form habits and then you're coming to tell me how I should inform my habits with your <laughs> schemes in the future. I am not going to listen to you very clearly, am I? You're right, you're right. Uh, and I think the, our desire is to actually have this information available to anyone. Mm. Look at it this way. The life in which we are living today is a part of a continuous journey that started generations past Th and that will continue for generations to come we are here to probably create a bridge between that and and one of the biggest desire that we have as ICA Lion group is that we will help everyone to understand that what we have custody of now 
is not just for us it's actually for the generations to come after us mm. and we have solutions that can actually help you achieve some of those dreams that are short term medium term long term and generational and one of our biggest uh, burden is to help the society actually understand that there is very practical information to help achieve a lot of these plans mm. a lot of these dreams and aspirations who is your typical client you now as a icli on trust what's the what's the age what's the age bracket for your client it, it ranges from zero to a hundred no no, no. practical <laughs> no, no, no. okay Wh who's coming to you so so th there are several <laughs> solutions that we provide within the trust company okay so for the estate planning solutions we're talking about now generational wealth yeah uh, ideally the ideal client is between 45 and 70. Mm. that's that's a majority mm. because what they're thinking about is whatever we've worked hard for how do we structure it to flow to the next generation yeah and and the earlier you set up your estate plan the better it is because you'll walk the journey to mature it mm -hmm. i normally call that a maturity period that once you set up your family trust today mm -hmm. as part of your estate plan then you will experience how it takes care of your wealth so that by the time you're going mm -hmm. it will be a smooth transition into the future mm -hmm. but now for the other simple trusts to take care of education and all that mm -hmm. so we are seeing a lot of parents mm -hmm. who are just starting off life yeah uh sometimes grandparents would come in to take care of their grandchildren mm -hmm. but a lot of, a lot of our clients have been parents young uh, parents young parents right or medium age parents mm. but we also have retirement savings solutions mm. as part of what we provide within icli and trust company mm. so those solutions would be either institutional so our clients are also institutions mm. some of them would be smaller institutions that do not want to set up a fully fledged occupational scheme retirement yeah. benefit scheme yeah so they would come in in an umbrella framework mm. where you are in, a, in, a, in an environment that is fully compliant mm. but you want to protect your three employees mm. or your ten employees and be compliant with uh, with uh, the requirements of the retirement savings mm. and the, within the group you also have individuals who are just starting you know their careers and they're saying retirement does not begin when you're 50 yeah. right. it actually begins when you just get employed yeah so within uh the group we have individual pension plans mm. you know both within the asset management and within the insurance framework mm. um that that you can actually start off your life and start building a kitty okay uh, very well so somebody has been listening to this conversation they've been hearing what's your plan and they're thinking yeah, i've got very many plans and those all those things that you've said a part of their plan that's right and they they know it's ic lion group let's say they walk into ic lion today you have all these different companies and sub companies and ic lion group what kind of interactions should they expect that then directs them into the right place when someone walks into ic lion and they say now i was listening to peter uh, i have children three of them one is in grade ward the other one is green ward the other one was born last week and education is some part of it i'm also thinking uh retirement i'm also thinking you know i want to start putting up a kitty for now my children because i can see my family and i'm thinking and they are thinking of all these things plus also i'm thinking insurance and life insurance how will they be walked through this journey that's actually the beauty of what we are doing right now mm -hmm. because you're saying what's your plan and we want to begin that conversation from there and that conversation may lead into i want to achieve this mm. i want to educate my children i want to have a savings kitty mm. i have a small i'm an entrepreneur i have a company that i've started and i want to protect those assets mm. i want to protect liabilities that may accrue from that business mm. we want to begin from there and that's the boldness of this question where we want to begin from you as a customer right then begin the conversation from there and what solutions now would meet some of those aspirations that you have so who's this person that i'm meeting when i walk into ic lion is it a receptionist is it a financial planner am i meeting peter's secretary am i going to peter's office 
who is my first po point, point of, in of interaction? Point of interaction. There, there are several points of interactions within ICLION. If uh, in, in the digital age, you can go to our social media and you will get an immediate response mm -hmm. at ICLION in, uh, in X, um, at ICLION in uh, Instagram, mm -hmm. ICLION group in LinkedIn, ICLION group in uh, uh, Facebook. Or you can come to ICLION branches all over the country. Mm -hmm and you'll meet someone that you can actually begin the conversation with. If you come to the head office, we have a very well-equipped customer service department mm. that those conversations uh, can be had. Uh, within that uh, function, you have information about all the group solutions. Mm. Or you can just give us a call. We have a very 24-hour contact center that you can actually reach us uh, on mm. to just tell us what your plan is, and mm -hmm. we'll start the conversation from there. Okay. okay. Yeah. So plan.icelion.co.ke. Visit that website. It's a microsite. It's a brand new one for this campaign. Visit it today. You'll get all this information, and you can even get a chatbot, and you'll be interacting with somebody on the other side. Peter Washira, CEO, IC Lion Trust Company, has been our guest this morning. Think big. What's your plan? Put your plan into action. It's 8 a.m. Spice up your life. Good morning, this is the News Wire. I'm Lea Umaga. The doctors' protest to push the government to address their demands continues today in Wasingishu, Migori and Kisumu counties. Tomorrow, doctors in Mombasa and Nairobi counties will also hold demos in an effort to raise their concerns with the Ministry of Health. Doctors have been on strike for the 14th day today after the negotiations led by the special committee created by the Ministry of Labour hit a dead end. The head of public service fellow Kuske, who led the talks, failed to reach an agreement on the issues raised by the doctors, who described the meeting as one that's full of threats and intimidation. This event comes as governors will today meet to discuss the ongoing doctor strike, as well as the implementation of court orders issued by the Employment and Labour Court last week. The emergency meeting of the Council of Governors is coming at a time when medical services have been paralysed. And yesterday, doctors and medical interns in Nakuru County marched from the Nakuru Annex Hospital to Governor's Office towards the Nakuru County Assembly buildings before completing their march at the Nakuru Referral Hospital over the 2017 CBA. To urge the government to fasten their belt to ensure that the issues on the table are solved as quick as possible to prevent the ongoing doctor strike and to prevent the suffering of the common Mwananchi. In Mary County, doctors protested the government's plan to start sending medical interns to various hospitals from April after reducing their salaries. Doctors official Dennis Mugambi vowed that they'll not return to work until the government fully restores their privileges. By reducing the salaries of doctors by 91%, we shall not accept we are members of this particular country, we are citizens of this country. Patients seeking medical services at public hospitals have continued to struggle as they don't know where to get help. At the Kisi Referral and Training Hospital, surgical services were unavailable. Some MPs, including Babu Owino from Member Kasi East as well as Gadoni Wamuchomba, have given the government seven days to deal with a doctor's strike or they'll submit a bill to remove health CS Susan Achumicha from office. The CS, Cabinet Secretary for Health, who, is, who has proven to be very incompetent. Yes. Yes. Very incompetent, talking in rallies anyhow, talking in funerals, and we want that CS to step aside, and we will bring an impeachment motion against the CS for health. We want the president himself to call for a meeting with KMPDU. This event comes as the latest group after clinical officers to issue a strike notice are the Kenya National Union Medical Laboratories officers. NTV journalist Rita Tinina will be buried today at her home in Naro County about two weeks after her death, which autopsy revealed was pneumonia. On Monday, relatives and friends gathered at the Holy Family Basilica for a memorial service where they gave beautiful 
household tributes. Tinina's partner Robert Nagela described her as the most stubborn person he had ever met. Rita, who passed away at the age of 46, has left behind a child named Mia Malaik. Rita, when our paths first crossed, your beauty, hearty laughter and warm heart touched me. You are also the most stubborn person I ever met, principled in your beliefs. Nina, last Sunday, your phone stopped ringing. Your passing has left a void that cannot be filled. But I am comforted with the fact that the memories of time spent will live on without us. That's the news wire. I'm La Obaga. One oh two point five Spice FM Kisumu. If a lion shows you its teeth, it doesn't mean it likes you. <laughs> it doesn't mean it likes you. <laughs> it won't start. <laughs> <laughs> a liar calls as witness one who is either dead or far away. Say it Below, you You know this uh, character called a uh, liar. He has disturbed people. Mm -hmm. So when you tell him uh, who are your witnesses, he will take you to a place where it is difficult to verify. For someone like me who sweats uh, a lot, <laughs> I cannot survive there. <laughs> you know, sweating is biblical. Good. <laughs> and you must blame it on Adam, not me. You know, because <laughs> Adam messed up. And, uh... Okay, after 8 o'clock, traffic in the city, is it? Yes, it is. Um, off the Sika Superhighway, which will be normal for some time as you get through that tunnel. But then let's look at Aerodrome as you get from Langata Road out towards Uhuru Highway. That's jam-packed. It's bumper to bumper. There's a traffic on Rilo Dingoe, some of the traffic that came off Langata Road. Now folks trying to get the faster route into the city, and you're going to then join with what's happening on Gong Road. As you come in on the Sika Superhighway, we see also traffic on Kiambu Road, and it's going past DCI now. It's increasing as we go past eight o'clock and on Limuru Road all the avenues of Parklands are feeding into Limuru Road so that's causing some traffic as well we're still in traffic hour let's see what happens as we come out of it in a short while we'll talk on Spice FM KE on X hashtag the situation room It's critical that people pay taxes. But then, taxation has to have a limit. When you start overtaxing people beyond certain limit, then this now we call robbery, robbery and violence. We are all struggling, but we don't show. If you're not doing well, shame on you. But you have to say, I'm broke and I'm struggling. <laughs> we are not okay until everybody is it's okay. okay. We are pretending to have political parties. Why don't we just be honest? And we say, these are the Luyas, these are the Kambas, these are the Kikuyus, and we are find ourselves in Kenya. You know, with, with politics and leadership, no matter what you do, <laughs> there will always be a complaint. <laughs> there will always be the assumption that you're either stealing or you're not doing things right. As a leader, don't fear. If you know you're doing the right thing, you've thought about it, you've got an expert advice, do it, then understand later. This country, we don't need prayers. Prayers mm. is between you and God. Good governance and thinkers who care about the country and not their stomach. That's what we need. The Situation Room. Kenya's biggest conversation. This is The Situation Room, the home of hard-hitting political commentary and penetrating insights about the state of the nation. This is a talk radio experience like no other. The Situation Room, a place for hard truths, debates, and elevated conversations. The Situation Room, witty, political, engaging, deep, controversial. In the room, we have C.T. Muga, researcher, academic, seasoned political observer, a fountain of wisdom in these politically uncertain times. Ndu Oko, Nigerian by birth. 
Kenyan by choice, communications expert, pan-Africanist, a truth seeker and believer in people power, and Eric Latin, agent provocateur, the man in the chair, seasoned journalist, news hound, a man who believes in punching up, not down. This zero, seven, is the two, five, situation room. Triple zero, triple two. What's that number? It's the number mm. that you call or WhatsApp <laughs> if you're interested in buying a quarter, uh, an eighth, <laughs> a half. How many plots do you want? The entire plot, plot. If you want to buy, every, in fact, you say, <laughs> Serenity Spring, stop talking to people. I want all. I'm coming. That's the number that you call or you WhatsApp. 0725? 000, 000, 000. Okay. And if you SMS the word plot, where do you send that to? You send that to 20321. <laughs> plot. Plot. To 20321. Okay. Mm. If uh, you come through to them, CT, mm -hmm. you'll find username investment people on the other end. Yes, you they'll will. They'll tell you about Serenity Springs. They will. And they'll tell you how much an eighth of an acre is going for. They will. And what else will they tell you? They will also tell you mm. that unlike certain developments where you will be met with earth that has not been trampled on for the longest time, yeah. perimeter fences that were pronounced but don't exist, mm. maram roads that don't exist, mm. boreholes that don't exist. Mm. With Serenity Springs, everything exists. Okay, sorry. What has been, no, you're absolutely right. <laughs> everything, the above, clearly stated, exists. Exist. Uh -huh. Yes. And the price that you are told you are required to pay will not change. Mm -hmm. It is that same price. And it includes everything that has been mentioned. And neither will it change in the near or in the future. Bas. Kabisa. Yes. If you'd like to visit Serenity Springs in Lanet and you're in Nairobi or in Mombasa or wherever, take the Nakuru Highway. Naivasha. <laughs> all the way gil -gil. you get to gilgil elementite and then you get there mm. once you get there my friend mm -hmm. yes mm. you will before you get into nakuru city proper you'll get into lanet another way you know this is safari early weekend mm -hmm. and people are going the to be mm -hmm. the yeah. in naivasha <laughs> And that whole area between Naivasha and Elementator, so it's gonna be busy. Mm. And you're thinking, oh my goodness, I'd like to avoid that traffic, but I'd like to go to Lanette. Mm. Uh, even Kenha saying, you want to go that side? Actually, there are very other, various other routes that you can use. Leave Nairobi. Hurururu Rironi. Hurururu You get to Sokomjinga, right? When you're in Sokomjinga, you're in. By the way, you have left Nairobi. You left Kiambu. You are now there in Nyandarwa County. Yes. Sokomjinga. There's a flyover. That place is called flyover because of this interchange that has the overpass. Take that overpass, and then you will get into Javine. Javine. Jabini. 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 In Jabini, look around the land. You will see, you'll under, and you'll understand why they say cash crop. Because mm. that's what they're growing. Mm. You will get to a place, small, small two towns. One of them is called Engineer. It's a town. Past Jabini. Mm. Okay? Then you'll get to Ol Kalau. Then you tell them, Ol Kalau, how do I go to Lanet? Lanet. They'll tell you, take this route. You'll get to Ol Joro Rock. They didn't go to the two. Oh, Jororo Rock is now the Ndundori ah. into Lanet. And from Lanet to Nakuru City. Mm. So when you get to Lanet, you will see username. This is the color green and red. Mm. You'll see the posts. Green, red posts. Just know I am here. I am in Lanet. Ask them where is Serenity Springs? They'll tell you Uno Ile Gate Pale. In Giapo. Umefika. Umefika. Okay? Yeah, so then you'll get to use the Dunduri scenic route. The two Dundus, yeah. Mm, from Jabini to Engineer to Old Kalau to Old Joro Rock to Dunduri. Thank you very much. To Lynette. We are here. Yeah. 0725 again, triple zero, triple two is the number to call them. Let's talk about health. So we have heard doctors' strike has gotten into the, has entered the 13th day. Clinical officers are threatening to go on strike. Lab technicians are saying they want to go on strike. First of April. <laughs> I don't know. MPs are threatening to impeach the minister. <laughs> All those things are happening. The point is, when people are going to seek health services, are they getting 
the health services that they want. The Director General of Health is uh, Dr. Patrick Amoth, currently still in, in an acting capacity. He's our next guest in the Situation Room. Dr. Tari, good morning. Good morning, Eric. Welcome to the hot seat of the Situation Room. Thanks for having me. It's good to have you here. We will be discussing very many things that we've talked about. You know, as the boss of provision of health in the service in the country, you have a lot to tell us and to educate us and to answer. CT will first give you the day's proverb. Every week he goes to one African country, then he brings us proverbs from that country. What we'd like you to do is listen to the proverb and give us your interpretation of it. Are you ready? Ready. Very good, CT. Go. Yes, the cleverness of one alone is a shallow well that soon dries up. The cleverness of one alone is a shallow well that soon dries up. This is a proverb from Mauritius. The, yes, the island republic of Mauritius. Mauritius. Yes. Dr. Amorth, mm. what's your interpretation of that proverb? Nice proverb. My interpretation is that you cannot be able to do everything alone. You need the rest of uh, the community, the rest of the people, so that we can be able to prosper and move forward together as one big people. Mm. City? He has interpreted it very well. It's clear it speaks to him in the manner he has just mentioned. Mm. Yes, and he understands you cannot do these things alone. This lone ranger mentality where someone thinks they can do everything on their own is completely misguided. Where's Mick? No, nah, you need others. <laughs> you need others to walk mm. the journey with you. Mm. Dr. Amoth, what's the job of the Director General of Health? The job of the Director General of Health is one of those jobs that is prescribed in law under the Health Act 2017. And one of the responsibilities of the Director General of Health is to be able to advise the government on all, all health matters in the health sector. Number two is to the, is the principal technical advisor to the cabinet secretary. Number three is to advise the two levels of government on health-related issues. Number four is to prevent introduction of uh, diseases into the country. Mm. Number five is to be able to support uh, data generation and uh, research on health matters. Number five, the Director General is also responsible for the internship program. And six is to be able to advise the Ministry on licensing of health facilities. And usually there is a caveat in all the description as any other responsibility assigned <laughs> by the appointing authority. Just to name but a few. <laughs> so that you don't leave anything to chance. Yeah. yeah. So basically, um, the Director General of Health should be mm. a doctor. For you, to, for you to offer all these advisory services and to oversee all these things, mm. you, by expectation, should be a doctor, isn't it? By the definition and what is in the law, yes, that is true, according to the Health Act uh, 2017, Clause 17. So I'm right to say that you're the senior most doctor in the country. <laughs> <laughs> By virtue of my position, but I have also my seniors who taught me who are working in various sectors. Okay. Yeah. All right. So when we have the a smooth running health sector, we have a lot to thank the Director General of Health. True. Similarly, when we have challenges in the provision of health, in accessing health, we have a lot of questions to pose to the Director General of Health. Correct. Okay, let's now start posing the questions. Currently, Dr. Tari, mm. doctors are on strike. Thirteenth day. They've been raising issues. There have been meetings in the ministry. This, uh, there's been about implementation of CBOs, CBAs. There has been an issue of posting of interns, medical interns, plus others. Why are we where we are today? We are where we are today because one of historical issues, two, the changing ecosystem in the health sector. Uh, for a long time, you know, we only had one medical school, the University of Nairobi. Now we have 13 medical schools. So the total number of people we are churning out in terms of our graduates from our training institutions has increased. While in terms of our guidelines, our policies, those policies have not changed in tandem with the changing ecosystem. So, for example, what we are going through now in terms of the placement of interns is a question of um, uh, 
And we need to look at this through the entire value chain mm. from entry point into the training institutions, the exact training program and where we get the out the products or the outputs and the end consumer of this product or output which is the principally the ministry of health and of course the private sector and the faith-based organizations mm -hmm. so for a long time we have operated on the paradigm that um, the numbers were manageable if you look at the total number of interns that have graduated over the 10-year period, the number has increased threefold, from 214 in uh, 2014 to around now 880-something, close to 900. Mm. Uh, that number has increased despite the allocation for the Ministry of Health for the internship program not increasing in tandem with the increasing numbers. Mm. And of course, that num increasing number also brings other issues, including where do we place them? Because we have a fixed number of internship uh, uh, positions in uh, uh, different facilities. Mm. And because internship is principally an experiential learning, where you're supposed now to translate the theory that you are taught into medical school into clinical practice, how you can be able to examine a patient, how you can be able to pick a specimen, how do you communicate with a patient? then it is imperative that the numbers then are also in tandem with the facilities where this training is going to take place including the necessary infrastructure the necessary human capital in terms of the health specialists because internship you work under supervision of mm. medical officers and the specialists mm. so basically for now the problem has been uh, underfunding in terms of exchequer mm. And uh, we noted this uh, in, in, in 2023, the Honorable Cabinet Secretary communicated to our counterpart in the National Treasury, mm. requesting for additional funding to be able to support the internship program. Mm. The response from the Treasury was that uh, it is no longer sustainable with the numbers that we have, and the Minister was advised to be able to develop a policy position to look at the numbers that could be sustainable within the fiscal space that mm. obtains us at now. Mm. And in the final comments of the CS Treasury, one is that the budget 2023-2024 was being implemented under tight fiscal framework and uh, with the projected uh, revenues not meeting the object objectives and they and also increased uh, requests or requirements for payment of um, other priorities including loans and therefore we advise to rationalize what we have within and as a result of that our request was not honored mm. so basically that is the genesis of this problem okay so now that's where it all started that's what's currently going on um the number of things that you've said even before this is that you said one of the problems that mm. plagues this arena is that policies that have gone over time unchanged so that's one now when you put that together with some of the issues that you've talked about here fiscal framework tight fiscal framework what is not available rationalize things that this arena again has previously done what would that mean and would it make sense then if one of the things they said was okay let's not send the number of interns that we are sending out into the different spaces let's reduce on that number would such a thing then make sense from a health services point of view it will make sense from a fiscal perspective mm -hmm. but of course if you look at our numbers in regards to the health workforce that we require vis-a-vis -vis our population and our demands that is not a good thing to do mm. but so it's a, a, a dilemma kind of a situation where you have to balance things out here you don't have sufficient numbers but on the flip side you also don't have the adequate resources eh? mm. so you need to be able to balance and find out what can be able to work for your population and one of the things that we did uh, was to be able to have a paradigm shift in delivery of healthcare services in this country Ever since we got independence, our health service delivery has been curative driven. You get sick, you go to hospital. In mm. fact, our insurance, national insur health insurance scheme was called the National Hospital Insurance Fund, mm. meaning you could only be able to access that service if you are in a hospital. Mm. Uh, if you are in hospital. So we are basically funding sickness. Mm. 
But now what uh, the global world has told us is that it is better to prevent disease than actually deal with the sickness. Mm. And that is why we have had this fundamental shift towards primary health care based on a strong community health system trying to use the community health promoters as people to help us in basic things but also to increase demand generation for healthcare services through a preventive promotive approach knowing very well that even the WHO has projected going forward that the global community is going to have a shortfall of 10 million healthcare workers 45 percent of that shortage will be in low middle income countries mostly in sub-Sahara Africa so for the foreseeable future, we are going to have a challenge in terms of numbers of healthcare workers. And the best way that we have been told, global world over, to be able to achieve universal health coverage is by investing in primary healthcare systems. Because these systems are inclusive, they are comprehensive, they promote inclusivity and equity, ensuring that nobody is left behind in terms of health service delivery. Okay. The number of institutions that were offering uh, medical education like you said we've increased from one to 13 to 13 now mm. the number of students graduating mm. with a medical degree has increased 214 just uh, 10 years ago to close to 900 to close to 900 presently those are locally trained graduates locally trained. remember there are also graduates who train outside and Kenya who go to Tanzania Kenyans who go to Ukraine, Kenyans who go to all over, and, and India, they come back. And they all come that back. That is another yeah. 500, around 500. Every year? Yes, graduates every year. Okay. But we've been knowing this. We have been seeing it increasing. I mean, it's government that licenses these institutions and allows them to offer these uh, courses. The Ministry of Health is, this, it can see this is happening. We have X number of students now in school studying and they're there for six years, so they, surely it's not like a six-month course where you, you may have turned the other side. What has happened over the years in terms of the Ministry of Health communicating to the National Treasury, communicating to Parliament on budgetary allocation? Uh, that communication always takes place, that we need more funding. But that communication that goes to the National Treasury, to Parliament, comes from all state departments in the government. Mm. So here you have one piece of cake, everybody's angling for this cake. So the, pa the, the parent or the father or the mother who is distributing this cake ensures that Muga gets a small piece, Eric gets a small piece, Ndu gets a small piece, Amov gets a small piece. Mm. So in summary, what we need to do is to be able to bake a bigger cake so that everybody's needs are satisfied. Mm -hmm. But you have raised something very fundamental in terms of our visibility in the training institutions. Eric, you may be aware of a judgment that was passed on 11th of June 2020 by the High Court regarding Commission of University Education and various regulatory bodies. Mm. And the judgment was that it is the Commission of the University Education which has the oversight in training institutions, mm. not our regulatory bodies. Mm. So as the CEO of Kenya Medical Practitioners Dentist Board or Chairman Professor Hainga and Dr. Karyogi cannot walk to the University of Nairobi to be able to inspect that in training institution. How many doctors do you have in this class of 2023? How many lectures do you have? How many laboratories do you have? Mm -hmm. So we have no visibility and we are bad, is bad by law mm. to be able to visualize the end product that we are going to, to use. But it doesn't bar you from communicating to the universities. You know the 13 institutions that are going to be sending students to you for internship. Oric, there's something also that fundamentally happened in this country a while back. Mm. This problem did not, was not there when we used to have the regular program alone. When we started having the parallel program, which is a good thing, mm. so that we can be able to make education accessible to all, mm. I think the interpretation of our teachers regarding the parallel program was not correct. The parallel program has been interpreted as a source of revenue. And now we are battling even with quality issues because the numbers in terms of the space, like for example, the Nursing Council of Kenya mm. has clear, and even the Kenya Medical Practitioners Dentist Council has clear 
uh, regulations regarding the size of a class, mm. the number of lecturers that should be able to run that class, mm. the number of other facilities required to ensure that you, re uh, you receive quality training. But that is not happening. And in fact, now, because of that lack of visibility, uh, you find universities starting courses that are usually only offered at specialist level. Somebody tells you, I'm going to give you a course in uh, epidemiology and biostatistics. From where we sit as a ministry, as an international community, we know epidemiologists are super specialist trained people. Mm. Then they come to the ministry that uh, my daughter, I actually have received uh, like four or five letters, my daughter trained in this university and cannot be registered to practice. So how do we register you to practice epidemiology and biostatistics? And yet we know our epidemiologists, you must get a fundamental degree in medicine, then mm -hmm. you go and now study this deeper and deeper. So definitely we need to have a conversation with the training institutions so that we can be able to align this. Am I hearing you say that there is a broken system in how we are training our health workforce? Because training is not complete, even according to the law. The training of a doctor is not complete until they have completed the internship. True? So that they can then be registered by the Kenya Medical Practitioners and Dentist Council as a doctor. Very true. And this, tra this internship is the purview of then the ministry and, and, uh, and the council at the end. But you do not have any say in everything else up to that point. That is why I talked of the value chain that uh, we are missing in action at a very important in a very important part of that value chain, and we need to have this conversation so that we can be able to correct all this uh, that have not gone the right way. But still, Daktari, I am still uh, at a loss to imagine that graduates come to you in the last moment with a medical degree seeking to be placed for internship and that you do not know you are for example you're saying you do not know how many will be graduating this year out of these 13 universities that number is now visible because of the coordination that we are put in place through the training institutions through the kenya medical practitioners and dentists council and because of that we changed even our posting uh, system because previously we just used to post interns once now we have had to change because of the increasing numbers now we do the first posting in quarter one of the financial year mm. and then we do the next posting in quarter three between january and and march so it is not something that is entirely it is something that we have been looking at discussing the relevant uh, sectors including the national treasury the education system. You remember sometimes in 2022 we had a big conference in Mombasa which was opened by then His Excellency President Uhuru Kenyatta to be able to look at this fundamental. Yes. yes. Bringing all those actors together. Mm. That is the conversation. This is where this conversation began and it is good that even during this strike we need to be able to bring all these pieces together so mm. that we can be able to address this matter once and for all. We address it for futuristic, for posterity, so that we have a system that functional, is functional in, in its entirety, despite the shocks thrown at it. Okay. Let's take a break. We'll continue the conversation shortly with Dr. Patrick Kamoth, the Acting Director General of Health and Ministry of Health. He, we, he is here so we can discuss the state of healthcare in this country. Which way forward? We are seeing these strikes. They're becoming sort of like a norm. We are seeing issues with provision of health services, the quality of healthcare being uh, pro provided in the country. All these questions need answers. He's here to provide those answers. We'll be back shortly. This is the Situation Room, the only way to start your day.
Looking for top-tier sheet metal design and fabrication services? Look no further. Duff Engineering in Nairobi offers premium solutions for cable management systems, electrical switchboards, streetlight poles, and more. With cutting-edge technology and a commitment to excellence, we ensure your project meets exact specifications. Call Purity Kifinji at 0113-170-654 or email sales at duffengineering.co.ke. Visit us at 11 Kitui Road off Kampala Road industrial area. Your satisfaction is our priority. Visit www.duffengineering.co.ke today. It's part of the county. The weather with Spike. Spike. Looking into a sunny Nakuru, 19, 19 and sunny. In Yeri with 17 and sunny conditions. In Eldoret, Mombasa is sunny at 30. We'll see highs of 34. And looking into a sunny Malindi at 30. We'll see highs of 33. Cloudy conditions at 23 in Kisumu and partly sunny conditions at 22 in Kakamega. Kampala's cloudy at 20 with Dar es Salaam sunny at 26. And we're looking into a sunny Johannesburg at 15 with sunny conditions at 30 in Mogadishu. It's 16 and sunny in Addis Ababa. And looking into a mostly clear Lagos at 28 with light rain now starting in Kinshasa at 26. Build Spice. All right, it's heavy coming off of Limuru Road this morning, and we're seeing that whatever traffic was coming in from Muranga Road, uh, not so much right now, but it's still pretty heavy as you come off of Survey on the Thicker Superhighway, as well as traffic continuing to be busy on Kiambu Road. Most parts of the city getting some traffic here and there, but then as you get out of it, you'll be fine. And there's Kamkunji, heavy traffic coming off of Landis. Uh, bumper to bumper through the city, past uh, Wakulima and then out towards uh, Haile Selassie. So that's going to be busy for some time. Raila Odinga Way is also busy taking traffic off of Langata Road. But then Langata Road going towards Aerodrome Road, very, very heavy as you then approach Uhuru Highway. Guess what? The Southern Bypass, free, clear, all the way from Mombasa Road out towards Langata Road. Think about it. You never know. Let's talk on Spice of MKE on X. Hashtag The Situation Room. Mature, intelligent talk every morning. Spice up yourself. Mornings done right. 94.4 right, Spice FM, Nairobi. Nairobi. Acting Director General of Health, Dr. Patrick Amoth. Doc, even as you talk about these things and say, well, look, okay, so here the, the, the strike presents, you know, a golden opportunity to actually look at some of these fundamental issues that you've raised and say, look, how about we fix this thing once and for all so that we're not doing year on year threats of strike, actual strike, you know, and more people saying let's strike. But with the things that you've mentioned, these are fundamental issues, lack of resource, um, lack of, you know, re strategy. So, with the doctors having down their tools today, with clinical officers, lab techs threatening to do so tomorrow, be, or the next week, because of fundamental commitments having not been met, and we can't deny that, is such action then justified in the face of it? And would that be then an adequate push for these conversations which you've admittedly stated need to happen, need to be fixed. Is it justified for that purpose? Uh, thanks, Do. Uh, first of all, strikes are very unfortunate events and uh, effects of strike disproportionately affects women, children, elderly people, people with disabilities, people who live in underserved areas because these are all other people can be able to access alternative health services in case of a strike. Mm. That notwithstanding and the pronouncements of the courts, both the Labor Relations Court in um, <laughs> Labor Employment Court in Nairobi, mm. Order Number 6, and uh, the High Court ruling in Kisumu filed by the Kisi County Government that outrightly declares the strike illegal. I would still want to plead to my colleagues that we come to the negotiating table, go back to work, we negotiate on these things. You remember the Kenya Kwanzaa government is one of those bold governments that actually put the issue of health on its manifesto with clear, tangible 
goals. Yep. But that notwithstanding, this is an opportunity for us to be able to discuss these things once and for all and be able to generate a discussion and come up with tangible action points. It does not matter how long we are going to settle them. Mm. We have those things that we can be able to deal with immediately. Mm. Like the issue of payment of the basic, basic, basic salary, mm. which like for, the, for example, the national government has paid to the fullest. In fact, uh, we, we demand uh, a refund of 81,000 from the doctors because there was an excess payment. Mm. There is the issue of the comprehensive medical insurance services. Eh? Mm. 36 counties have enhanced schemes with uh, various insurance providers. Mm. And the national government employees, of course, has a, um, a scheme under the Ministry of uh, Public Service. Mm. Our level six facilities have their own private schemes. Again, that is something that we can be able to thrash quickly over the table. Mm. and eh? So we can be able to tick the uh, uh, boxes regarding these 19 action points raised by the union. Mm. Then there are those that require medium to long term approach because of the budgetary constraints. Mm. And you know, there's a budgetary circle prescribed by law that we have to, to follow. Mm. Then we can be able to prioritize those ones in, in, in order of uh, what we think is important and then deal with them and give them even a timeline mm -hmm. it may not be possible to solve all these things in two three years but maybe a time frame of five to ten years we can be able to deal with these things once and for all but dr amoth one of the issues that they have raised is mm -hmm. that these conversations have taken place before and that there has been a commitment from across board but unfortunately they've not seen these things being done and that it is easy to hide under the cover of the reason of lack of resources whereby there are some things that you can actually do without the exchequer then taking that um, uh, problem on their shoulders the institution of a health service commission for example something that they've asked for forever um, some of the um, uh, contracts being made we, we understand that it has you know a, a resource responsibility attached to it as well but one of the major issues that they do bring up is that Every time that there's a threat of a strike, there's a promise to ensure the commitment is fulfilled. But then the, when they do go back to work, that, that commitment then is put on the back burner and is not dealt with. What would you say about that? Thanks, Du. Let me take this with the Royal View Mirror. Mm -hmm. Before we launched the Universal Health Coverage Program in Karich on 20th of, uh, of October last year, we had initiated a discussion with the unions, mm. the professional associations, the academic institutions, the civil society. We came up with an 17-point, uh, 18-point action plan. Mm. And some of the things that have led to this strike are squarely within that, those 18 points that we raised. Mm. We generated together mm. at uh, Windsor Go 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 Golf Club. Mm. Uh, in our approach towards universal, universal health coverage, we also had pillars, and one of the pillars of UHC is Human Resources for Health. Mm. And in, ter in terms of sequencing, we, had, we have four pillars. Pillar one is health financing, pillar two is health products and technologies, pillar three is the digital in, uh, health information system, and pillar four is human resources for health. Mm. And pillar four is the living pillar of all these because it is the one that has the human face. Mm. And in terms of sequencing, we said we can be able to quickly turn around the health financing, mm -hmm. change, and you saw the laws that we passed to be able to move from NHIF to now Social Health Authority. Mm. In terms of health products and technologies, again, we thought that was a low-lying fruit. We could be able to take administrative decisions, mm. give additional uh, capital to KEMSA, make changes here and there in terms of cons composition of the board. Again, that has been done, and now our order fill rate has improved significantly, especially for essential medicines and medical supplies. Mm. And in the digital ecosystem, again, that has moved, and we are working with a consortium, including Safaricom and the big hitters in the telcos, to be able to change how we deliver healthcare services. The human pillar of uh, UHC is the most difficult pillar. And therefore, we had proposed that upon the launch, then we can st continue to have this discussion. Unfortunately, now we're in the strike. Mm. But it's good that some of the things raised 
in the strike are the things that we had planned to discuss. Mm. So that tells you the goodwill of the government, mm. that we had thought about this beforehand. We had initiated those discussions. However, now we, have been, uh, we are in this situation. Mm. And therefore, what I plead for is that this discussion needs to take place. Mm. And this goodwill from the government, we should seize this goodwill, especially my colleagues from the union, Let's seize this moment and see. This is a different government. Maybe things will work out differently. Mm. And that what again emboldens me when I sit here with you is now this, the direction again of the court. That some of these things are so fundamental that we need to address this as a whole of a nation approach under the leadership of the head of public service. Mm. The Honorable Judge in his, his, in his wisdom must have looked at those things and said, this one cannot be sorted by the Ministry of Health alone. Mm. Let's bring the entire government and the entire society so that we can be able to have this honest conversation. So now, what's the way forward? As you sit and you're looking, because Human Resource for Health is where we are at right now. The various issues, unpaid dues, um, some of them saying, you know, there are conditions for work not conducive in terms of provision of health, uh, of, of, uh, health insurance looking at the training of healthcare workers and them not completing their training because lack of resources. What's the way forward? Uh, it is a no simple solution to this problem. The way forward is that we need to be able to have this honest discussion, leverage, lobby, bring everybody into the space so that we can continue to prioritize our health services in this country. We have made significant progress, Eric. Mm. Uh, in 2023, last year, in April, we released the data for Kenya Demographical Survey. And this looks at fundamental health indicators for the country. I can tell you without fear of contradiction, more children are living to see their fifth birthday more mothers are attending. In fact, our, our, our target for mothers attending antenatal clinic was 80% by the year 2030. We are 90% at, at the year 2022. Mm -hmm. And investment in health is an investment in the economy. We should not only look at health in terms of uh, as a service delivery thing, mm -hmm. but we should also look at it from a microeconomic and macroeconomic perspective that if you invest in health, people who are healthy, they are likely to be more productive and they will be able to spur economic prosperity. The other thing that uh, is that investment in health, if you look at the healthcare workers, the majority of healthcare workers are women because it's a service industry. Mm -hmm. So through that investing in health, we also promote inclusive inclusivity gender parity and women empowerment and therefore that makes us move together as one whole nation instead of leaving people behind mm. we should continue to prioritize investment in health because of its many beneficial effects the implementation of health and uh, this devolved system of government has had its hiccups and the healthcare workers have been saying, you know, because we are dealing with 47 different employers, and then there's the one employer also who's national government, who also has some of our doctors, maybe we should harmonize this and have one commission. What's your view on this matter that has been pushed by doctors for so long? Have one central health services commission that employs and then um, attaches doctors to facilities or counties? Thanks, Eric. Again, I told you the health workforce is probably the most important element of any healthcare system. It takes more than 60 to 70 percent of the total health expenditure of any healthcare system in terms of wages, stipend, salaries paid to healthcare workers. And we saw the importance of uh, this element during the COVID 19 pandemic. You could be able to have the latest uh, machines, you could be able to have all the money on planet Earth, but your people will still die if you don't have. Healthcare workers. Yeah. That is a good suggestion to have a commission, but that I don't think is the one, is not a panacea for all our problems. So we have the Teacher Service Commission. Do you have all the teachers that we need for our schools? No, we don't. No. Are teachers not threatening to go on strike even as we discuss now? Yes. Actually, let me answer your question. Do we have enough teachers for the schools? We do. Do we employ enough teachers for our schools? We do not. Because we produce, we seem to produce more teachers than we can employ, and it appears like, same with healthcare, 
we seem to produce more healthcare workers than we can employ. True. Yes. True. So the anomaly lies there. So why aren't we employing? Because of the size of the cake? <laughs> Doctor, is that what you're going to say? Uh, I told you my job description and none of it deals with anything financial. <laughs> <laughs> you are the principal advisor to the Minister for Health. On technical matters. On technical matters yeah, of health. Yeah. And therefore, by extension, the principal ad advisor to the president on matters of health. True. And the advisor to the government on matters of health. There are two levels of government. Right. Yeah. Both levels of government. Yeah. So when it comes to matters such as ensuring that we are meeting our needs for health care, you are the one who would say, look, with this kind of population, with uh, this kind of need, we need this number of doctors. And then you would also say, then we therefore need to graduate this number of doctors. We need to register this number of doctors. We need to retain this number of doctors in a country per year. You are the one who's, that, who's doing that. You implemented the Jubilee Administration's universal health coverage under the Big Four agenda. You are now implementing the universal health coverage under the plan of the Kenya Kwanzaa administration. You are right, right there in the middle of it. What are you advising them in terms of the number of doctors and healthcare workers that we need in the country and allocating money for it? If you don't, like you said, you may have the best equipment, you can work on financing healthcare, you can do products and technologies, but if you do not have proper human resource for health, the entire health system will collapse. What have you told the president? Thanks, Eric. Very good question indeed. And uh, we, are, we, have, we have done some work in that space. One, last year, we did what we call the health facility census in preparation for universal health coverage. We sent healthcare workers from the counties, from our affiliated uh, institutions, our sagas, and the national government to visit more than 14,000 health facilities, public, private, faith-based, including standalone clinics. We generated a very, very good report, which was launched towards Christmas. I think that is why it never received the public attention, mm. Mm. to be able to tell us where we are as a country in terms of infrastructure, in terms of equipment, in terms of human resources for health. And one of the things that comes out of that report is that the WHO uh, guidelines as at now for we require about 23 healthcare workers per 10,000 population. We are at 10 healthcare workers per 10,000 population. Out of the 47 counties in this country, 12 counties have achieved that global target. Mm. Therefore, 35 are lagging behind. But don't look at this target just in its absolute numbers, in absolute entirety. We also need the skills mix and the distribution to be equitable. If you have achieved that population, uh, that, that ratio, mm. but your healthcare workers are only in the urban settlements, mm. then again, you are not on the right trajectory to be able to achieve universal health coverage. Number two, there's a document that we are supposed to launch called the Health Labor Market Analysis. Now looking at that entire value chain from production, absorption, those who have not been absorbed, attrition, deaths, eh? mm. And even the number that we can commoditize, the number that we can be able to export outside mm. through bilateral labor agreements and uh, like the one we signed with the UK, mm. that report is ready. But that notwithstanding, still because of the tight fiscal space, we anticipate by that uh, by 2031, we'll have a shortage of nearly 100,000 healthcare workers. By 2031? 2031. 2031. Mm nearly 100,000 work, healthcare workers. As at now, we have a total of about 190,000 healthcare workers. Mm. Our doctors who are in both public, private, and administrators like me, I'm also counted as a healthcare worker, mm -hmm. though I don't provide direct service, mm. we are about 13,000. So doctors perform about 6% of that entire health workforce. And it's also important to know that uh, healthcare workers work as teams. 
and therefore you should not be able to just, just look at one facet mm -hmm. we should not be able to discuss these things in silos there's the role of the nurse the role of the clinical officer the physiotherapist the pharmacist the dentist together together collectively is how we can be able to deliver wholesome service mm -hmm. So we have the numbers, we have the projections, we have the cost estimates, and uh, I will not be able to disclose that now because the report has not been officially sanctioned. Mm -hmm. uh, but that is one point of our conversation going forward. Okay. So that is you have, we have tried to look at these things from a fundamental perspective so that we can be able to deal with the root cause of this perennial industrial action. Then, Dr. Okay. Mm -hmm. with UHC being one of the big five, in the Kenya Kwanzaa plan to make sure that it's it's uh, implemented this president even has his own technical advisors on health matters on universal health coverage you as the senior most medic you have all this data and information and saying we need to make sure that we are training doctors we are bringing doctors who are either training locally and abroad they go through internship we absorb them so that we can deliver health services the way we need to and this is how much we need it then does not sit well with me where a conversation then happens on you need to send interns we don't have money please explain to me is it that the explanation given at cabinet level because this matters that the, the budget is discussed by cabinet before it's taken to parliament the minister for health sits there and says this is my need and my need, because I am supposed to provide training for health as, for healthcare workers, I need X for training. The National Treasury CS can sit across the table and say, I don't have enough money. What would the boss say? I need to deliver universal health coverage. Is it that the message is not packaged well enough to be understood by all? I think the message is clear to everybody except uh, the situation that we are dealing with uh, the fiscal space. I think that is the problem. And it's not unique to Kenya, including the developed world. Despite the resources like UK, for example, there's still shortage of health workforce in the UK. It's not that they don't like, lack money. If you look at the health outcomes of the United States of America, despite that investment, it's not only money. If you look at the health indicators of USA compared to a country like Costa Rica or Cuba for that matter, mm. you'll see the disparity. America per capita expenditure on health, more than $5,000, $7,000 per person. Costa Rica, maybe $1,000 thereabouts. But if you look at the outcomes, different. So the question is not only, um, uh, only about money. But, but, but Doc, which of those countries that you've given as an example mm. has a drop? in the point of training because posting of interns is still on training True. we don't even talk about absorption at this point mm. if we are not finishing training of doctors because of financial constraints which other country can you give us an example that has trained a doctor for six years but cannot register oh, this doctor that, because that, this doctor that, that, that is has not completed. even tanzania now currently is dealing with this problem in fact the proposal for tanzania is that instead of now paying uh, having the interns leave college and do one year of internship outside they are proposing a radical departure that they do that final year it becomes part of their training okay. so and and even morocco that is the way it happens huh? so you do everything internship is when you graduate Okay, mm. but now if we, if, we, if we look at what's happening in Kenya mm. today and we're on the cusp of hoping to deliver UHC mm. and we're looking at some fundamental things that must be done, do you see earnestly a situation whereby UHC will be delivered in the manner in which it was envisioned with these issues that we see currently happening? Oh, I, I'm still very hopeful because I believe this, uh, this is just turbulence in the system and things will self-correct. But remember I told you our thinking of which is the, the fundamental departure. I know security services, services will still continue. Mm. But we believe that if you put a little bit on the primary healthcare system, and studies have been done showing clearly that if you invest 
a shilling in the primary health care system, then the returns are about 13, 14 shillings in return. So we believe if we can be able to strengthen our primary health care system, then we can be able to fundamentally change our health outcomes. Mm. That notwithstanding that, as we deal with the curative services, where the doctors, the interns are still paramount. I'm not saying that the primary health care system is going to replace the interns. No. Mm. The health care system must still function along the continuum of care. Mm. That there's somebody who will start from a primary health care level and end up in a level six super specialty hospital. That care must be provided. I'm skeptical. Mm. Mm. Primary health care mm. is to be funded from taxpayers, mm. right? Yeah. In the current spectrum. Right. Yeah. The primary health care, level one, one from two. community health worker to level one, level two, mm. that should come from the exchequer, as yes. from the national treasury. Yes. This same one that does not have money <laughs> to train interns. <laughs> to send interns to their <laughs> yeah, post this for the, the last same one <laughs> who have ensured that they're actually garnering the finance needed for this system through a different model of taxation, mm. isn't it? Yes. So they cannot then say that they do not have money for this. To send interns? No, no, no. You see, I don't understand. Where's the miscommunication? Training in healthcare. Is it under healthcare? Is it under the Ministry of Education? It's under healthcare. Under the Ministry, Ministry, Ministry of Health. Yeah. Under the Ministry of Education. Education. Yeah. So, Kenya education. Training. Yeah. Precisely. Mm -hmm. So what we were saying, therefore, mm. is that they seem not to communicate. Yeah. Mm. Silos. Typical they seem not to communicate because there is a need and the need is obvious to all and yet that need is not being met simply because the principals who should be communicating about this issue so that the planning and the financing of it is in order don't seem to be on the same page. But then if it's the Ministry of Education then they have to be excused because... You're right. Uh, the, everything that falls under the purview is in total chaos at, at the, the moment. moment. No, 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 no. We have a whole of government approach. Okay. As Dr. Harry will remind you. True, Doc? <laughs> <laughs> all of government, all of nation. <laughs> all of government, all of nation approach. But Doc, thank you very much for joining us today. Mm. It's been an interesting conversation. Please, come again. I will. We I come again fantastic. for two hours yes. so that the public can also get to talk to you. Yes. Okay. There's a lot especially to understand when it comes to the thinking of UHC, how we roll out UHC, how we then improve our health services, how we even change our own uh, care-seeking behavior about health. We could discuss about UHC next time. Asante. Thank you. Dr. Patrick Amoth is the Acting Director General of Health. He's been our guest. Keep it here for more conversations, 9 a.m. up your life. Good morning, this is the news wire. I'm La Obaga. Health CS Susan Nahomicha has been summoned by the Ethics and Anti Corruption Commission in a probe into hiring of a politically connected PR firm to handle Lafay House matters. Nahomicha is alleged to have breached the Public Procurement and Disposal Act 2015 guidelines in awarding Crestwood a lucrative communication tender worth millions. And Ford Kenya women in Busia County have sent a strong warning to Transoya Governor George Nathan bear over verbally attacking National Assembly Speaker Moses Wetangula, led by Rispa Mora and Pauline Nagila. The women say that if Natembea continues to attack Wetangula on public platforms, they'll lead protests across the western region to his home. It should be noted that Wetangula and Natembea had to flee to their safety at a funeral in Transnzoia after their followers started a fight. Na tunaomba kwamba kama kuna jambo lolote ambalo limekukera wana uh, Mulembe Nation ni watu wa amani hatungependa kuharibu hilo eh, jina la Mulembe lianze kuwa vurugu kwa hivyo tunaomba upatie mheshimiwa Moses Masika wetangu ambaye ni party leader wa Ford Kenya mpatie heshima yake papa wa Roma ambayo inchi nzima ya Kenya imempatia na vile unavojua yeye ni speaker wa National Assembly amepewa heshima kwa hivyo tunakuomba bwana governor patia papa wa Roma heshima zake ya tunakashifu kabisa na kusema koma papa wa Roma mwamesi yako hiyo sisi tutatembea tauchi paka kwa mlango yako kabisa 
Residents in Nairobi have been given seven days to identify bodies of their loved ones lying uncollected at three mortuaries in the city. In a notice, the Nairobi City County said 130 unclaimed bodies are lying at City Mortuary, 38 at Mbagathi Hospital Funeral Home and 17 at Mamalusi Kibaki Funeral Home. Acting County Secretary and Head of County Public Service Patrick Anala said most of the bodies are those of victims of murder, accidents or natural causes. The Kenya National Highways Authority has finally swung into action to repair a dangerous pothole that tormented motorists along the Waiyaki Way in Nairobi. This is after a citizen shared a video online on Tuesday documenting how the pothole near the Kempinski Hotel punctured every car tire that passed over it. At the time of recording over five cars had already parked by the roadside awaiting a mechanic's attention. And President William Ruto says his government won't relent in the fight against alcohol and drug abuse as it's robbing the country of its working force. Ruta said the fight against alcohol and drug abuse won't stop until the war is won. We are also intentional on dealing with those who want to corrupt our young people with drugs, with illicit brews, and we have put down our foot that it cannot be business as usual. We cannot have a drinking nation. We must have a working nation. And it cannot, it cannot be both ways. In different events in Nyandano County, Deputy President Rigada Gashago has continued to warn security officers who neglect their duties in the fight against illegal alcohol and drugs, saying that they'll be punished. And our security team, the new county commission and your team, you have the law now. You are good. Please do your work. Mufanya kazi bana. Eh, nasi tumekubaliana. Hakuna transfer. Mtu akishitwa na kazi anafutiwa tu hapa. Marori ya kupeleka misigo imejaa hapa Nyandaro. Please and you are doing a good job. Carry on. Interior Cabinet Secretary Kithure Kindiki while in Naro County reiterated the sale of alcohol near educational institutions and places of worship won't be allowed. We have a national campaign which is relentless and permanent and we will continue crushing drug cartels and people who are selling poison to the people of Kenya. We will continue crushing them mercilessly and we are not going to listen to any voice any distraction we will remain focused and here in Narok already good progress has been made it is prohibited for a alcoholic outlet to be next to an education institution or a place of worship that's the news wire i'm lao obaga Four point four Spice FM, Nairobi. It's the tail end of traffic hour, and it still looks like it will be busy for some time coming off a of thicker super highway. But it's all manageable; nothing too painful at this point. Just that survey, and then you'll be through the, the tunnel and out in no time. Muranga Road, however, getting towards the roundabout is busy uh, as you come into the CBD. Are you coming out of Westlands? You're all right. Um, James Gishiro, not much happening here. Coming off Waikiki into the city, um, you're all right as well. So this is good for the most part. Let's see what happens by the time we're out of traffic hour, but I think we've managed Wednesday coming out with not a scratch. Let's talk on Spice FM, KE on X, hashtag the Situation Room in a short bit. This is the Situation Room, the home of hard-hitting political commentary and penetrating insights about the state of the nation. This is a talk radio experience like no other. The Situation Room, a place for hard truths, debates, and elevated conversations. The Situation Room, witty, political, engaging, deep, controversial. In the room, we have C.T. Muga, researcher, academic, seasoned political observer, a fountain of wisdom, in these politically uncertain times. Ndu Oko, Nigerian by birth, Kenyan by choice, communications expert, pan-Africanist, a truth seeker and believer in people power, and Eric Latin, agent provocateur, the man in the chair, seasoned journalist, news hound, a man who believes in punching up, not down. 
This is the Situation Room, the only way to City, start your day. City, what are the day. amenities at uh, Serenity Springs in Lynette? Well, let's call them value additions. Okay. Concrete poles, perimeter fence. Okay. Maram Road. Okay. Elegant estate gate. Okay. Tree cover inside the estate. <laughs> Electricity on site. Bohol water. And a price that doesn't change. Everything you are told is all inclusive. Now, can you ask uh, for more, really? Eh, uh, no way. Everything includes all the. Yeah, and once you're told this is the price, that's it. No, we thought yesterday we had a dream. None of those things. Mm -mm. It stays constant. Mm. Yes. <laughs> oh, you know, you know, yesterday, you know. Yeah, no, not a scene, no, no, two billion end. You had a CCC. Ah, director Alisama, your bay. Ata walo walinunu walo wakonza Walibatika sana Ata watu na tutalipisha kitu Extra Itakuwa noma sana Kaini chini Mark, sit, sit Sit We are on air The gentleman who just walked in Is Mark Mark Bichachi has been here many times before So we all know him And that's why we can speak to him like this He's a com communication strategist Good morning Mark Morning, morning How are you doing? Good, good Happy New Year I've not seen you this year Buana Imagine eh, Happy New Year Happy New Year to you too sir. Good to see you Nice to see you You're looking healthy I hope so Oh <laughs> Yes Ata pesa pia, you're looking healthy money wise. Ah, uh, I like your faith. Let me say, let me say amen. <laughs> yeah? You're saying amen? Yes. Oh, okay. that's a prophecy. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and, and as you come into this conversation, uh, CT will tell you, tell, tell him, tell, tell Mark about Lanette, Serenity Springs friend, in Lanette. You know, when you buy a plot, in fact, <laughs> the fundamental requirements have been laid bare mm. by Serenity Springs. Mm. This particular property, let me repeat what I just said. Say. Concrete poled perimeter fence. Mm -hmm. Okay. Maram roads, elegant estate gate, tree mm. cover inside the estate. Mm. Electricity. Electricity. Tree elegance. Electricity. Tree electricity. 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 <laughs> electricity on site. <laughs> Bohol water. But the thing that really gets my goat is the price. It's all inclusive and it does not move. None of this it rained yesterday. Mm. You know how it is. Mm. Yes, exactly. Mm -mm. Okay, OPEC or message. You are Mr. Manini Yes. Did you say OPEC? I said OPEC. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. So how much? One point four nine nine. One million four hundred and ninety nine thousand Kenya shillings. And you pay? Uh, you can pay any installments if you like. You can pay in three installments, six mm. installments, nine installments, twelve installments. Mm. Mm? All of them. Well, depends on what you can afford, really. Very good. Very good. Mark has walked in accompanied by another guest. Dr. Josephine Ojambo is a former Deputy Secretary General of the Commonwealth. She's our guest as well. Good morning, Dr. Ari. Morning, Eric. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. How are you all? We're fine. Oh, very well, thank you. Great. And how are you doing? <laughs> I'm very well. Yes. Delighted to be here this morning. A little frazzled by the traffic, but we are in one piece. <laughs> what traffic? <laughs> traffic. What traffic? There's no traffic here. Oh, really? Mm -mm. Did you try the expressway this morning? Yeah, there are issues on the expressway. Well, they've closed down one lane. I guess they're cleaning and draining uh, off the road and the okay. gutters. Okay. Uh, the man is biased. The, 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 the hour we come to work, there's usually no traffic. <laughs> ah, that's it. Yeah, mm. so yeah. Even if they close, then we don't even notice. <laughs> don't notice. Close the whole thing, if you like. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we, we, these are things we hear the people telling us about. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. So we'll be talking about, you know, you have been uh, in the diplomacy field for a while. Eh, bueno, you've been to places. <laughs> Commonwealth, <laughs> you are in New York for a bit, mm -hmm. and you'll tell us about other places and Kenya's position and place in this global world and, and how we play our diplomacy. And then now we tie that into where are we the ones who are being called to go to Haiti? Why? Mm -hmm. Because that's what Kenyans have been asking. Why are we going to Haiti? Why? When there's nobody else who can go there. You'll tell us. Why? Well, don't they have neighbors? Don't they have neighbors? Mm. And those neighbors, is, they've been meeting you, Caribbean, Caribbean, what, 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 and yes. saying mm. they'll be you as standby government. Mm. See, they go and deal with those issues. Why all the way to Kenya? Anyway, to welcome you to the conversation, CT will give you the day's proverb. It's an African proverb. 
From which African country? Uh, the island Republic of Mauritius. Capital city? St. Louis. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> Try again. I know you are going to tell me it's called Louis. No, you said Saint. I said Saint, eh? Yes. Oh, it's a port, actually. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Who was St. Louis, by the way? It's a guy. Nah, it's, it's not a guy. <laughs> there's, a, there's a... Wait a moment. No, there's a place in the U.S. called St. Louis. St. Louis, yeah. Yes. There is. Uh, it's, this one is Port. Who's the president? The president mm. is a gentleman with a rather long name. I'm not sure. Okay? Mm. He's called Prithi V... Uh, no, Prithi Viraji Singh. Mm -hmm. It's one word. That is one name. Yes. Prithi Viraj Singh. Prithi Viraj Singh. That's one name. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the second name is the one which I really like. Rupun. R O O P U N. That's his, that's his surname. Not Ropun. Prithi Viraj Singh Ropun. Yes, that's his name. But his VP has a simpler name. It's called Eddie. Okay. <laughs> Eddie Okech. <laughs> no, that's the first name. Did you say Eddie oh, Okech? I said Eddie. You Eddie Okech. <laughs> no, I didn't say Eddie Okech. <laughs> Stop hearing your own things. Eddie's his first he name, his second it. name. Hmm. <laughs> Boy says Zon. Boy says what? Zon. Boy says Zon. Not what? Where? <laughs> Eddie. Boy says Zon. Zon. Yes, exactly. Now they have a okay. speaker. Now yes. this speaker also has a really interesting name. It's almost a compound name. Okay. Mm. It's Su Ruj Dev. Su Ruj Dev. Yes. And then his second name is Fok Ir. <laughs> now, I, I know you guys think I'm making these things up. <laughs> What I think Suruj I mean, Dev was what name? There was one name. <laughs> it was Suruj Dev. Dev. <laughs> Pukir is his second name. Now, what I may be getting wrong is the pronunciation. Mm. But uh, more or less, that represents the names of these individuals. Okay. Yes. What's the proverb? The proverb for the day <laughs> is, <laughs> the cleverness of one alone is a shallow well that soon dries up. The cleverness of one alone is a shallow well yes. that soon dries up. Yes. You've got the experience with this, Mark. So what's your interpretation of this? Uh, well, in, in my career, I have learned that when you have a client who thinks they know everything, drop them. <laughs> okay. Wow. Uh, that's a good one. <laughs> Dr. Giambo. What's yours? Well, I don't have as much experience as uh, <laughs> the legal mind here mm. on issues of clientele. But, you know, in international relations, we have an area called multilateralism, where many member states come to the table working with the UN, private sector, civil society, academicians and others. And I think we believe that in that context, we give the best to our interventions, our policy positions, our global good because we believe that together we are better than that single mind that soon like we've been told like the proverbial well runs dry nice. so we see it from the <laughs> perspective of potentiating each other mm. but i think the legal interpretation may be useful too you know if you find a member state that doesn't want to listen to others you soon drop them you <laughs> drop them you just let them go mark yes <laughs> yes let them be yes it's <laughs> as soon as possible first <laughs> meeting drop them okay yeah, yeah. Terry, tell us you know the places that you've worked in in terms of um diplomacy for the country mm -hmm. and then now you, you you'll be creating the basis for how Kenya has been dealing with the rest of the world in a, this multilateral world. Thank you, Eric, and colleagues for allowing me to share a little bit about myself. So actually, they do call me ambassador. Mm -hmm. I am an ambassador of the government of Kenya and therefore a diplomat. We apologize, Your Excellency. Oh. Uh, we, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we will not get it wrong again. <laughs> Thank you. Both titles are very important. The doctor it's actually important. came first, mm -hmm. the ambassador later. Mm. And um, just tell a little bit about myself. Uh, before the appointment into diplomacy, I was already an internationalist, having worked with the UNICEF, uh, UNDP, WHO from time to time consulting for them. So I look at that as a base upon which the decisions to then retrain me as a physician and 
public health specialist in diplomacy we were well made. There was a basis there and of course my support for the late former President Kibaki. So the nomination into diplomacy allowed me to then serve as Kenya's ambassador and deputy permanent representative to the Kenya mission to the United Nations in New York. I worked there for about uh, three and a half, four years and then uh, applied for a position at the United Nations at the Secretariat. I worked for UNFPA, that's the Fund for Population Activities, for a period of two years, where I was their form of global ambassador, taking care of uh, external relations and intergovernmental affairs. Mm. From there, I was interviewed by the Commonwealth, and I joined the Commonwealth Secretariat working directly under the Secretary General as a Deputy Secretary General in charge of politics, human rights and the rule of law and communications initially. Later I would be asked to take over all technical areas which then included health, education, youth, women, climate change, macroeconomic policy, trade, oceans and natural resources as well as deputize the secretary general uh, what did they leave out or <laughs> 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 how many lives have you lived <laughs> uh, yeah yeah sometimes feels like that i think um what they didn't leave out i put in myself rest and what they call work-life balance i put that in for myself but i think more than that i think something that is enduring intertwined there was my love for my country hmm. my ability to continue to express kenya's trusted role in multilateral diplomacy that continued all through what is that role well we have lots of roles i think um the first that I want to go to, because I know where you want to end, would be our role in socio-economic areas. Mm -hmm. Kenya has cut a niche in areas of human rights. We have been known to stand for many issues, the rights of refugees, the rights of women, the rights of children. And at the UNGA, General Assembly, on many accounts, we have stood to the table to bring and pass resolutions on those areas. I'll speak about one that I participated in, and that was the political declaration on HIV and AIDS. Mm. Kenya took a leadership role in making that first resolution on a health matter, a point in the UN history. Um, Kenya has also then, of course, been a leader when it comes to the negotiations internationally on arms trade and uh, international peace and security. Mm. I'd like to say that uh, at a point when it was difficult to get resolutions such as those through the General Assembly, Kenya was able to lead negotiations with Australia and other players to get the arms trade treaty adopted. This for the UN and for the international community was quite a first. Mm. But beyond that, we have uh, very many Kenyan diplomats who negotiate around the administration of the United Nations. And I was happy to work with those in uh, New York. Mm. And then we also participate in cultural and social activities at the level of the international community. Kenya is also known for its, uh, should I say, trademark uh, engagement in cultural diplomacy, sports diplomacy. Mm -hmm. These are areas where, of course, we all know we make a mark. So beyond the issues of international peace and security, we have made our mark when it comes to international affairs. And those are a few things, a few insights into what we do. And I must say before I end, we have recently really claimed a place at the table on environmental diplomacy. Not too long ago, our president convened with the Africa Union, the Africa Climate Summit, and uh, one month ago, the United Nations Environmental Assembly gathered here in Nairobi and we deliberated on issues of chemicals and waste as they relate to international relations and affairs. So there we are. We're a trusted partner in many areas of the international debate and discourse. Mm. Thank you. Sounds like, okay, we do very well when it comes to bringing people to a table and moderating conversations and ensuring that there's an outcome. In those conversations we are peacemakers and peace builders we lead on matters that, that are saying okay let's take up a, a certain position on these particular matters but we don't interfere in politics and internal politics of others do we no we don't because we have a policy of geopolitical neutrality and it's not a policy that we hold alone it is, of course, a convention in many international institutions and groupings 
that uh, the sovereign territory of a member state should not be interfered with. So we are just carrying on what is known internationally as the way to behave with your neighbors. But if a neighbor calls on you for support and says, do come and help me bolster my efforts to secure my border or provide humanitarian assistance, then based on our ability, capacity, understanding of the region, engagement with the culture of those people, and perhaps the support of their neighbors, Kenya will rise to the occasion. And I think this has happened not mm -hmm. just once, but in many settings. We know from the 1960s that Kenya has played a role internationally in mm -hmm. peace and security. I think if you look back into the 60s, we came to the table on the matter of Congo with the United Nations. And uh, yes, it was baptism by fire, but that now helped us to embark on the trajectory of peacekeeping in other settings. And since then, we have been active in places such as Somalia, the Sudan, Sudan, mm -hmm. Liberia, Namibia, even Lebanon, mm -hmm. and further afield. So we have continued to, should I say, distinguish ourselves as being able to support those in need. And not just because of the issues of peacekeeping, but along with it, the concerns of humanitarian aid and yeah. human rights, right. yeah. and engage with the communities in the same motion so with these instances where there may have been conflict did the <coughs> nature of the conflict matter when kenya then was involved whether it was in peacekeeping or whether it was in um di diplomatic conversations because each conflict has its own character i think we've been able to see that you know world over so did the nature of the conflict matter or would Kenya say, look, there's a problem, let's go in? Yes, the nature of the conflict does matter. Okay. Yes, because you probably perform better where you've had a previous engagement mm -hmm. that's similar, or you have skills that you have built, or you have an understanding of the culture and the people mm -hmm. and what they consider important. Okay. And some of those go back to our own history. We are a country that uh, suffered under, for example, the shackles of colonial rule. Mm. So when it comes to being present at the table where a country wants to express its own determination, self-determination, having had that history, we are able to come to the table understanding full well the right to self-determination. Okay. And we have a history where we ourselves fought a colonial master in order to therefore liberate ourselves. So in that kind of setting, indeed, we have an authentic ownership of a shared struggle. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we're called to the table for other things. Um, it may be an electoral or post-electoral problem. We have worked in several settings where in Africa we are called to support countries um, at the table to negotiate or to set up post-electoral governance systems and mm -hmm. we have come to the table in those instances. It may be because of um, uh, adverse weather mm. and we have supported countries who have gone through situations of uh, drought and devastation degradation of land so there are many themes across which Kenya might have a shared interest but what's important is that we bond with the people mm -hmm. because you want to be welcomed when you go into a country mm. you want to feel that they understand you understand them and there's something that binds you sure. so that is, in fact, more important sometimes than many of the themes that we address. And upon entrance into these conflicts, situations, and when we say entrance, of course, that means now to take on a position of mediation, like we've seen that has happened for Kenya a lot, or whether peacekeeping missions are sent or be part of a greater peacekeeping mission. Have the conversations leading up to that entrance been bilateral, multilateral in nature, or has Kenya taken a unilateral decision to say, hey, look, there's a problem here, let us get in. How has that been? Yeah, the conversations take place at many levels. Mm. Uh, conversations take place between two persons. You and I may talk and say that indeed there's a problem and we can help. Mm. But those are usually bolstered by conversations between governments, mm -hmm. government to government, and also at settings where there's more than one government, like we said, you know, where you have a well of resources where, which may be multilateral or international. 
So in many settings, those all take place together. The order might not necessarily be individual to bilateral to multi. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it may be from individual to multi and then to bilateral, but they do take place so that when the intervention is offered, it's bolstered by neighbors, by regional groupings, by the international community, mm -hmm. beyond the understanding amongst two mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. So in many places that's taken place. Um, I might state that uh, sometimes when we intervene, the UN Security Council has provided the backdrop of policy support. Sometimes it's because the Africa Union provides the platform on which we engage mm. or a sub-regional entity like the East African community. Mm. And in many settings, this takes place, yes, with uh, the local interventions first, meaning between member states across borders, then regional or sub-regional groupings and then international groupings. But there is no, should I say, book which says that it must be in that order. Mm. So long as you have all the players at the table before you intervene, or grow growth of players at the table as you intervene that's what's important when it comes to sending people on the ground now getting closer and closer to the haiti conversation we have seen so yeah we have seen kenyan boots on the ground in somalia we have seen kenyan boots on the ground in it was it sierra leone we have seen kenyan boots on the ground in the drc what are we doing in kosovo in eastern europe what were you doing pardon eric in in eastern europe was it kosovo that we sent police officers um, in the 90s, when there was that conflict, that Yugoslavia, 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 the former Yugoslavia, yeah, former right? Yugoslavia, yes. yes. Mark, you right. want to comment on that one? Well, well you know, the, the interesting thing is that Kenya has actually been involved in 16 different conflicts mm. where it has sent boots on the ground. Now, there are two things that we need to put into perspective. That number one, a lot of the conflicts that were happening then were between um, uh, armies, and they were traditional warfare. Today, for example, in Somalia, Kenya has overstayed in Somalia, in quotes, because the battle is not between state players or uh, rebels, as you may put it. It is between uh, Al-Shabaab and a government that is trying to establish itself. The issue here also is that many of us do not know, like for example in Sierra Leone, we did not just deploy the army, we also deployed the police. Mm. And because that has not been stated, the nature of the conflict going into Haiti is different from the other 16 that have been there mm -hmm. and then two the demands of haiti are different as compared to for example sierra leone in the 1990s because that was a, a formal conflict mm -hmm. again the issue about haiti it's not an issue about distance neither is it an issue about kenya being too willing to walk into a place where it shouldn't we need to understand that each time kenya has exercised um it's 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 sovereign right to to help uh, neighboring countries and countries for our field what we've done is that we've actually tested our military and police capacity as a country we've also gained a lot of knowledge in terms of handling hard situations which is why kenya is relatively such a peaceful and secure country if you don't believe me let's compare ourselves to ethiopia or sudan or south sudan or uganda or you know basically only tanzania really uh, beats us in terms of how peaceful we've been and we are a military uh, powerhouse in the region that said the situation in haiti requires a lot of prior understanding of the situation and why there was a choice for police rather than the military in the initial concept as to what kenya should enter and that's the question i was actually mm -hmm. coming to because in the moment many of these places apart from uh, yugoslavia sierra leone where we saw police officers being deployed yes. you know, these are the places we are sending military and they're part of a peacekeeping mission mm -hmm. and peacekeeping is basically just being a buffer between the two warring sides you're the ones who are coming here and you're saying okay you guys it's, uh, it's, it's, come on guys let's let's secure the population while on the other hand we are leading conversations between these warring sides yes. back at home right mm -hmm. in this particular case of haiti police and we are not saying that we have uh, you know sent uh, ambassador dr julio jambo to go and talk to the conflicting <laughs> at the table we're not doing any of that that's what we're seeking to understand what exactly what the, what are the different parameters in this particular engagement from the other 16 if if i may before dr comes in mm. uh, 
uh, Haiti is not a situation where the people causing the problems are people who can come to the negotiating table. For example, mm -hmm. if you look at the Ameri American-led process that led uh, uh, the uh, Henry to, to resign, that they'll create a council, did you see any of the gang leaders being part of that council? We need to understand that Haiti is not a situation where the gang leaders are trying to take over office. The gang leaders are trying to ensure that that country remains lawless because it is in that lawlessness that they profit. Therefore, uh, you, yes, they profit what? from the lawlessness. Yes. Okay. Are you saying... Okay, you're calling them gang leaders. Let's call them ga gang but, leaders. But they okay. are called gang leaders. Okay, yeah, they yeah. are called, but uh, are, yeah. are, they, are those called... Uh, so the armed groups mm. in yes. Haiti... The gangs that have... The ones together. that, for example, ensured that uh, Henri does not come back into Haiti yes. after he came to visit Kenya, a peaceful country. Yes, led by Bambadou. And, and he did not go back, you know, with, with the kind of peace that we sent him with. Yes. The ones that were ensuring that he does not go back, are you saying that they do not want to establish a government? No. No, I think Mark has told you their short-term goal, because it's really a short-term goal, is to obstruct service delivery. They have gone and taken over uh, a port. They are taking uh, possession of oil reserves. They have made it impossible for services to reach the population. So you have a population now that has no food, no health. They are creating internal, in quotes, chaos. Why? Now, this goes back to the fact that they do not want to have uh, a real Henry return because in the history, the recent history of Haiti, you realize that Mose, the gentleman who was killed in 2021, the former president, mm -hmm. actually had Ariel as part of his team. Ariel rose through the ranks. And um, despite the fact that Ariel then took power, there are still questions of popularity, mm. where popularity to the, to the outgoing assassinated head of state may still be much larger on the ground mm. than Ariel Henry has been able to have accrued to himself. Mm. And this is why we have gangs on the ground marauding, really because they are unhappy. Unhappy because it was promised to them that there would have been a democratic election at this time, mm -hmm. which has been postponed, mm -hmm. and therefore Ariel Henry remains in office, and unhappy with his personage in office anyway. So, so they're not Mark against saying, an election. They're not against, they're not against the formation no, of a not. government. They're it's not. They're just the against government. the form of government. So what the problem here is, is actually law enforcement. It's not a conflictual setting between two different jurisdictions or someone from a different country coming in to invade Haiti. It's about internal law enforcement. And that is why the choice of a police force as opposed to a military intervention per se. But mm -hmm. the police are well trained. We're not talking of the run-of-mill policeman, the traffic policeman, or the one who you know in your community takes care of your law and order. We're talking about police who have been properly trained for the deployment that is being sought. In fact, we're talking about a reconnaissance mission first, followed by an intervention. And Kenya's role as a leader is not that Kenya is going in alone with a force, a police force. We will be buffeted by support from neighbors, and from others, so we have Bahamas, Barbados, we have Jamaica, we have Bangladesh further afield, mm. we have Sierra Leone. So we're not going in alone as it were, we're taking leadership because, like Mark has said, we do have well-trained forces. We have um, in our country a center for international peace keeping support and we train not just the internationals but our own forces what, what, and so as a result we are ready to deploy mm -hmm. a very strong and seasoned team what are the terms of reference here we are going to deal with what mark is calling a gang mm -hmm. okay so to go to deal with the gang you are therefore going to neutralize the gang to disarm the gang to disable the gang you're going to war with the gang we're not really going to war with the gang. We might find, and this is why I said at the beginning, that when you deploy, it's important to understand the culture and community of the people amongst whom you're going to work. Mm. If you look into the history, mm. with the occupation and the colonial heritage relating to France and the U.S., we believe that Kenya, an African nation that has ties with Haiti, who are people of African descent in diaspora, 
might put it that way, that there is a close understanding of cultural and social context and historical context. Mm -hmm. So we may find a warmer reception, I say warmer, that is to be tested. And that's why we're talking about reconnaissance. It may not be the need for us to necessarily, um, like you have said, mm. uh, or obliterate the, the forces on the ground, the, the, the gangs, the mm. gang violence, but rather restore law and order. Make sure that services run. Provide a human, humanitarian intervention. Uh, address the human rights issues as well as create peace and keep peace. Mm. So we see a number of terms of reference, not necessarily in the first step, decimating the violence. However, mm. our police force has dealt with the issue of gang violence even here in Kenya. Mm. Yeah. So it's not that we don't have the capacity, mm. but we may not necessarily want to do that at first. Okay. We may find that it's easier for us to work on the ground there than it has been for other forces. Okay. Uh, and then we must remember that the reason why a country like Kenya is chosen and, and, and uh, the, uh, staying away from the French and the Americans is because of the very negative history Haiti has historically with specifically the French and a bit less and more modern times with the Americans. Kenya is not considered as a country that is coming to quote unquote invade and occupy Haiti. So we have that advantage. Secondly, we must understand that when you look at, for example, let me bring the, the an example from whom if you look at the stated intent of a gang such as Mungiki it was never a gang that was going to take over uh, Kiambu County and make Kiambu County their county their their intention and their and their and their way of doing things is different so when ambassador here speaks about uh, creating law and order it it just does not just speak in terms of the traditional peacekeeping force that mm -hmm. you'll come into a country and then there are two sides and then they'll create a government of national unity. We're talking about getting gangs out of the ports because three million people are not getting food. Okay. We're talking about getting gangs out of the uh, bread basket of Haiti because they are, they are, they've scorched earth, they've uh, chased away farmers and they've lost uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of acres of food just in the last one year. So you're talking about a situation where uh, the insertion of Kenyan police force mm -hmm. is to ensure that there is a tendency towards normalcy instead of a tendency of creating uh, a government of national unity where barbecue and his gangs are then in government. I, I, okay, yes. let me ask a question. So we've talked about the necessity of anybody entering into a conflict situation to have historical knowledge mm -hmm. to have social knowledge and social knowledge now yeah we're talking about language we're talking about the lay of the land we're talking about terrain i mean it's peacekeeping conflict resolution 101 mm -hmm. for anybody who sat in a four-walled classroom in anything about conflict right so those are the things that we are talking about so is kenya and when we're talking about language, en français, many, many things happening here. Is Kenya well placed to deal with that, number one? Number two, the forces that are being sought to send to Haiti, what is it that will be done in a manner that has not been attempted before in Haiti to quell gang violence that we see, to bring an end to some of these activities that you speak of, that has not been tried by anyone before to deem that this would be successful? Wow, two large questions. Let me start with the first. Um, you asked about um, the shared history, mm -hmm. culture, language between Kenya and Haiti. And I will speak to what recently we had debated at the Security Council when Kenya was on the Council, mm -hmm. 2021 and 2022, I think eloquently put by Ambassador Kimani of Global Africa. And I want to start at that level and then come back to the issues of Kenya. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, it's clear to all of us today that uh, we live in diaspora. And what is diaspora? If you look at what Africa is, is Africa a geography? Is Africa history? Is Africa an aspiration, a place you seek to go to if you are in the US mm. or in Haiti mm. because you want to affirm your identity? Mm. Those are the questions we must first address. Having addressed that, understand that even as Kenya, we have 
our children, grandchildren, parents and others living in the diaspora. Mm -hmm. This is the nature of shared history that we have with Haiti. There's of course as a result of transatlantic slavery, one of the greatest atrocities that the history of the world actually has documented. Mm -hmm. And having said that, looking into the history of Haiti, another thing that we share is the fact that from their history we look at two liberators, um, one of them being a man called Laurent, Toussaint Laurent, and his uh, compatriot uh, Dessalines, who were able as slaves, disempowered, to actually create a revolution through resistance that gave them their independence. In fact, Haiti is known globally as the first black African country to have independence in 1804. I'm bringing all those to the table because we can find facets of the same within Kenya's history mm. and those are the things that by the way our police force and other forces are exposed to during training. We do have a shared historical legacy or trajectory when it comes to culture. I think if you have and I'm sure you have traveled the Caribbean you'll find we share with them food. They eat things like uh, omrere which we call okra you know they eat beans like we do we also have with them a shared deep spiritual understanding of whom we are the context of whom we are as an identity to practice of africans <laughs> yes they call it's like it it's a, sorry that was it's a just context a, yeah. <laughs> i said I context there, yeah. but i want to ask <laughs> okay, you, please, you was, there's, a, there's like voodoo notes, yeah. there there's mm. juju in west africa mm. and perhaps there's some similarity in kenya many places mm. however let's build yeah. when you speak about their spiritual context there is a deep catholicism in haiti built on the african understanding of religion some of that we can translate to our setting here and then we can even go even further. Mm -hmm. The language, you've spoken about language. They speak Creole. Mm -hmm. Creole is a mixture of French with the African languages that were carried across the Atlantic by the people who were traded. Mm -hmm. So many of these are reflected even in our culture. And I want to say that we were not uh, without the ravages of slavery. We know that many Kenyans or many East Africans were actually traded out of the port of Bagamoyo across into Asia and you know and, and to the continent across the Indian Ocean so there's a lot of shared culture and history but what's important is that despite transatlantic slavery having been the movement and passage of peoples across from Africa to Haiti and by the way I want to say that during that time for every four Africans traded only one European left Europe to go to America or to the Caribbean Today, we are talking about a reversal, a sharing in reverse. We know today that with the touch of a button, you can trade in the Caribbean, in India, in Europe, in South Africa. Mm. But at the same time, we are also sharing amongst our young people. We are sharing sports. When Usain Bolt came to Kenya from Jamaica, soon after that, we heard about the emergence of Omanyala. Mm. and track and field as being something that young people, yes, we've had it, but we've now people like Omanyala who for younger generations remind us of the prowess of people like uh, Usain Bolt. We also now, in our stores, if you were to go, you would find Blue Mountain on the shelves. So we've spoken about the sharing of okra and beans and the dishes of the Creole nature, but we also find Blue Mountain coffee on our shelves, which comes from the Caribbean and is here. So the sharing is now both towards the Caribbean and backwards here. I'm so trying to I, connect I, between these f a thousand people who will go to Haiti and work in the areas of lawlessness and conflict with what is actually happening on the ground. So when I speak of language and terrain, it is in that context that I'm trying to make a connection. I'm getting there. Okay. And so I'm saying that is a basis on which there is a shared heritage. Mm. But I want you to know that our forces are not just trained, like we've said, mm. in military prowess. Mm. They're trained in cultural sensitivity, in the needs of communities, and in community entry. So that when our forces go, they will, of course, not just exert military force, but be able to engage on the ground with the communities there. That's the first point of entry. Mm -hmm. So I want you to know that indeed there is a level at which we will be able to engage. Mm -hmm. So I hope that answers your first question, that our forces are not blind mm -hmm. to the shared cultural history mm -hmm. and they're able to deploy, not just having deployed there, but you've heard about deployment elsewhere where we have been able to work on the ground. So it's not a new 
setting per se mm. but i did mention that it is a reconnaissance mission an evaluation and assessment in its initial form buttressed by neighbors who also know well what is going on in the ground such as jamaica barbados bahamas and like we've said the shared African identity. I'm repeating those so that it's clear that we're not sending them into oblivion. We're sending them to a place where there is a knowledge. knowledge. This question. Mm. Do the Haitians also understand and appreciate this kindred sharing that you've just mentioned? Do yes, they, they do. Yes, they do. In fact, I'm happy to let you know that not too long ago, Haiti itself asked to be a member of the African Union. It's documented. Many African member states were delighted that Haiti had reached out, understanding its role, not just as an observer at the AU, which it was until that time, but its affirmation of its identity by saying it wants to become a member of the Africa Union. Haiti itself fully acknowledges the Africanness of its people. In fact, Haiti has done a lot to influence leadership across the globe and in particular in Africa. Um, we do know that, uh, for example, some of the leaders, and I think I want to quote uh, some of the leaders uh, uh, of, uh, you might be able to help me with the name, um, who have influenced and taken care of uh, African liberation movements by providing finance from Haiti, by providing refuge for African leaders, but not just for Africa. For the African American too, I know they influenced Marcus Garvey and others. So Kwame Nkrumah, Kwame Nkrumah, Kenyatta, yeah. and others can tell you about a shared leadership identity with Haiti. So Haiti does identify with Africa and does identify with the struggle that we have gone through and has supported us over the years. Haiti, despite having had the continuous earthquakes, the civil unrest, and other should I say humanitarian crisis, has actually reached out to Africa to provide support for us during our most, should I say, defining moments. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, historically speaking, Kwame Nkrumah, uh, um, uh, Namibian uh, 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 civil rights activists and, 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 and uh, independence movements were actually housed and sponsored in Ghana because Ghana was the first one to get uh, independence. And there was uh, a conference that was sponsored by Haiti. So Haiti is well aware of its, if, of its Africanness. That's number one. Number two, we need to remember that when we deployed in Yugoslavia, uh, we were not same colors them. We were not speaking the same language. But there's something here that I think has been lost in our understanding of the current Haiti problem. What we are hearing from Haiti most, the people speaking the most, are the gangs. The people of Haiti, and it is so difficult to get information out of Haiti because the people of Haiti who are suffering from hunger, who are unable to feed their kids, who cannot, in fact, in one of the uh, more posher estates, there were 12 people killed last week for the very simple mistake of trying to get out of their house to go buy bread for their children. So the issue here is we may look at it just from the perspective of the gangs and what they're doing and what they're saying and how they've hijacked the airport and things like that but we're not looking at the people of haiti who mm. number in the millions who have a different problem and their problem is this before you even talk about the political solution they want to be able to live in a country where they can work because many of them have not been able to work for a long time mm. they're able to walk down the street and their daughters and mothers are safe because the amount of atrocities being meted out on women is increasing now on our side as a country we need to assess this situation from a humanitarian perspective mm. because if haiti is in the problem it is in and kenya can help for god's sake why not why not mm. right i want to ask belozi and even mark you can come in is it possible that this gang so-called gang has been given a bad name so we can stone the dog <laughs> in fact let me let me just i have when garang was doing the thing that he was doing in the early 80s yeah. was he called a freedom fighter by 
he was called a terrorist. Okay. Uh, in fact, uh, let's start in Kenya. Jomo Kenyatta was called a terrorist. Exactly. The Mau Mau movement was called a terrorist. So, a terrorist if, so as, we, as we describe, you know, the activities, they've blocked the airport, they're doing mm -hmm. this and the other, they have taken over, they did not want government. And Balozi even said, you know, this conflict was, has escalated after the assassination of the president and looking at the popularity of the, of the late president and the popularity of the uh, interim leader, and all those things and the promise to an election and there's no election that's forthcoming and the push towards election is it possible that the conflict in haiti pr at present is about seeking proper governance and leadership Le and the people to have their space let me give you a bit of a historical perspective okay you need to understand where the guns came from the guns came from politicians mm -hmm. and that's why there's a connection so what used to happen is a politician wants to sit i'm, I'm running against city mm -hmm. i will create a gang and they will beat cities people and things like that and then these gangs began to trade and to harass people and to do what gangs do which basically uh, includes fleecing businesses and things like that for uh, uh, security fees as they call it now what happened is over time this is now uh, late to so the small Jeshilo Mbakasi, yes. Rose and others. Yes, exactly. Uh -huh. So that's how it started. Then they began to trade in drugs and then extortion rackets in terms of businesses and things like that. Mm -hmm. Then those gangs became bigger than the politicians. The politicians then tried in the late 2010s to rein in the gangs. The gangs at that point, their business was so lucrative that they began to assassinate politicians all the way from members of parliament and things like that, right? So for a long time, you've got gangs and you've got political instability. Now what happens? The same gangs that we are talking about today are the ones who assassinated the president. He was not assassinated by a military leader and things like that. It is the same gangs that assassinated their sitting elected leaders, okay, and continued to do so. So what we see on the facade of it is we think it is a political issue. It is not a political issue for the gangs. It is survival for themselves. And then it is now joined to, to the hip with politics because that's how they originated that's why we need to think about it in two in two tracks not just one track so the history of them uh, absolves them from the uh, moniker that they are looking for any form of democracy or or to build haiti in fact if they were mm -hmm. the atrocities that they're doing today in the streets of haiti the number of people that they are killing raping and maiming would uh, would not stand up to because they are not killing cops they're not just killing army people, mm -hmm. they're literally brutalizing the ordinary Haitians. So they're deeply entrenched mm -hmm. in the society. Yes, thank and, you. And they may even, to the ordinary people, they may be a political solution to their daily lives. I don't to think, some people. I don't think that anyone on the streets of Haiti today would call them a solution. They are just a necessary evil for you to conduct your business in a particular settlement because there's a gang in your settlement, there's one in your neighbor's settlement, and in order for you to get on the street, you must be in good books with a particular gang so that you can sell your wares. There are too many gangs for them even to actually take over in a meaningful way any governance arrangement in Haiti. And that's why we want to now go in with others mm. and enforce the law. So they're like the drug cartels. Yes, they are drug cartels in and La beyond Latin that. America. It's they are like heavily that. armed, they have everything, and they're against the government, but they have a following. Yeah. They do have they a following, but the following also, mm. I want to say, is a following of people who are looking for the reinstatement of a governance arrangement that allows them to go about their daily lives without having to engage with these gangs. So that following is looking to an election that was promised them. It's looking to a leadership that can take them forward. And again, going into the history, if you go into the liberation struggle of Haiti, there's always been fractitious politics in that part of the world. Mm -hmm. Perhaps as a part of the colonial heritage, divide and rule. When we had Toussaint fight to liberate the country, his compatriot, Dessalines, mm -hmm. then is the man who took over after him, mm -hmm. but still was terminated by the same colonial master. Mm -hmm. And then we see many years, you know, 
fast forward, we now find uh, Mose, you know, taking over leadership and then again being, should I say, replaced by someone who was also part of his rank and file. I want to submit that this seems to be the culture and heritage that they have. So mm. one of the things our forces are good at is, is capacity. It, is it building. what they have or is it something that they have gotten used to because it is what has been created? I base my question on a fundamental question. How rich is Haiti natural resources? Well, their natural resources are really, I must say, amazing because even in, in spite of their sad history of, uh, I would say, environmental disasters, political instability, they've been able to support Africans, African leadership, African governments, and they still continue to meet the basic needs of their population. Is it not strange then that a country that is that rich in resources, do they have an army? Do they have a police force? You're coming to where I was just about to, to All leave right, off. then why don't you head in that direction? Since okay. we've already begun the journey, yes. Let's start that journey. Let's talk about capacity building and let's talk about a future and, uh, you know, building the socio-economic fabric of that country. I want to say that our police force, apart from everything else we have talked about as a TOR, are able to build capacity. They did that in Somalia, mm -hmm. and one of their terms of reference will be to also build the capacity of the forces in Haiti. We're not going in to offer an intervention and remain on the ground, or offer an intervention and then benefit from the people there. No, it is short, limited, it's actually a temporary intervention, which is allowed in our law, and then we build their capacity and come back. And why? Because indeed, with the lithium and other minerals in Haiti, and the other resources, they are good with their sugar and coffee, which has been a heritage of that country. They are able to trade internationally, mm. and they are able, therefore, to rebuild their own economy. Who benefits from this chaos? Because mm. uh, it's not just these gangs. Yeah, so who's funding them? Who's yes. funding them? <laughs> the let's, business let's of conflict here. is not cheap. Uh, let's start here. <laughs> if you just look at the guns they're using, most of the guns are from the United States, black market guns. Mm. There is commercial interest and there has always been commercial interest in Haiti all the way from 1804 because soon after independence, the French packed a very big ship outside Haiti and said that you're going to pay billions of dollars in uh, payment for us coming to your country, colonizing you and building roads and things like that. They only finished paying that in the late 90s mm. from the 1800s. So the French have benefited from Haiti. Many countries have benefited from Haiti, which is why the key statement is this, that for Haiti to get a solution, it needs a neutral party. Kenya is such a neutral party. Are we? Asked by the United States. Asked by the United Nations as well. Oh, come on, Mark. <laughs> yes, the United Nations did pass a resolution, didn't they? Yeah, it's yes, a, it's, they did. It's, it's a UN resolution. Yes, it is a UN resolution. Okay. It is a UN resolution. <laughs> yes. Okay. We'll go with of, that. Course, of course, of course, sponsored by the Americans. Okay. Final yes. question I want to ask. Just going yes. back to the two hours. For all these things to happen, we must eliminate the gangs. Mm -hmm. Right? For there to be peace, for there to be, you know, a restoration of law and order, for a government to be able to thrive, we must eliminate the gangs, or at least neutralize them or diminish their capacity. Like we did with SLDF, like we were trying to do with Al Shabaab. Is that it? Yes, so we are going point. to fight the gangs? We are going to fight them, but not okay. fight them as um, one might fight an invading uh, or an insurgency. Mm. Rather, like we have said, the gangs exist because there's a socio-economic need for them to exist. They can be rehabilitated. Okay. They can be deployed to do other useful socio-economic activities. After all, isn't that what we are doing even with the Al-Shabaab? We don't necessarily terminate them. We look for other ways mm. to allow them to exist by providing for them alternatives for their livelihoods. But we are, but, but we are hunting the leader to kill the leader. Mm. Well, we need to hunt the leader because the leader is the one who is the originator of all the interventions that the gangs undertake. Mm. But our goal may not necessarily be to terminate every gang member, mm. rather provide another socio-economic activity for those gangs to undertake that will allow the recuperation of that economy. Okay. Yes. You've shed a lot of light on this conversation. We thank you for joining us today. Alozi, Mark, always a pleasure. Ambassador Dr. Josephine Ojambo. So, instead of calling you former, former Deputy Secretary General of the Commonwealth, 
former deputy representative of the UN and for Kenya in New York. What are you currently? Thank you. I was almost beginning. I didn't beginning to think I didn't have a life with those titles. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Currently, I'm at the University of Nairobi on a, um, an assignment uh, which has been born out of innovation. We look at innovation as a pillar for socio-economic transformation for our country. I'm working in the Department of Chemistry doing some research on uh, the green transition, which is not just tree planting, it's also alternative forms of energy. Hydrogen. I'm also affiliated to the Foreign Service Academy, and uh, we are offering training at uh, the Department of International Affairs and Diplomacy, University of Nairobi. Thank you. Mark? You're still a communication strategist. Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us in Kenya's biggest conversation this morning. Have a lovely day. Two minutes after 10.